Call the meeting to order. A quorum being present, the 376th annual town meeting will come to order. I'd ask that you all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd ask for a moment of silence in honor of our troops serving abroad. Thank you. You may be seated. I've been advised by the town clerk that the warrant has been properly served. Since the warrant articles are printed in the advisory committee report, which you have for reference, I would entertain a motion to dispense with the formal reading of the warrant. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of dispensing with the reading signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? So voted and declared unanimous. I have nominated Scott Roberts as assistant moderator for this meeting and would entertain a motion to appoint him. Is there a second? All those in favor of appointing Scott Roberts as Deputy Moderator signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? So voted and declared unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Would the Assistant Moderator and the following tellers please stand to be sworn by the town clerk? Chris Mararchy, Penny Scott Pipes, Ron Robertson, Heather Santosuozo, Frank Snow, Peter Toppin, George Kelly, Jack Manning, Susan Frankel, Rich Travers. Madam Clerk. Would you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear to uphold the responsibilities of the position to which you have been appointed this evening? Thank you very much. And thank you all for your dedicated service. We have with us tonight, I uh, believe Senator Hedlund is somewhere on the premises. I don't see him right now. I can see him outside. And uh, Representative Cantwell. No, I think everybody's campaigning out in front of the building. They are here. Yeah. At this point, I'd ask the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen to introduce the members of the Board of Selectmen and the Town Administrator to the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, before I do that, I want to just take a second and thank all of you for attending the meeting tonight and participating in the town government. It's a very important task um, that we take seriously and we're glad you do too. Um, I'll go down the, I'll start at the far end. Town Council Jim Toomey. Save the applause to the end. Uh, Selectman John Danny. Selectman Rick Murray. Selectman um, Sean Harris. Selectman Joe Norton. The Town Administrator Patricia Van Casey. And the Town Accountant Meg LeMay. I'd now ask the Chairman of the Advisory Committee to introduce the committee members. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce the members of the advisory. I'll start down at the end of the panel. The esteemed Mr. Anthony Antonello at the end. Karen Connolly. Bob DiLorenzo. Kevin Dolan. Frank Judge. Susan Dayleader and more current. Thank you. I'd ask the chairman of the school committee to introduce the school committee. Good evening. 
The school committee from left to right is uh, Bill Johnson, Rich Heber, uh, Brenda Bowen was here, she will be back. Uh, Jamie uh, Strabino is in traffic on his way. Uh, uh, Jim Kelleher is here, our interim superintendent, and Paul Donald, our director of business and finance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Richard Bowen, and with me is town clerk Bernice Brown. I am the town moderator. The moderator chairs the meeting and decides questions of order. Please let me take a couple of minutes to tell you how the meeting works. Town meeting is a gathering of the registered voters of the town, convened in this chamber as a legislature, to deliberate upon matters set out in the warrant. We assemble here as brothers and sisters, each with an equal voice regardless of age, official title, or position. Not a partisan body, such with town meeting being more ancient than our country's political parties, is a place where each citizen legislator acts and is presumed to act solely in the service of our town's best interest. These have been our customs since 1636. In addition to these venerable traditions, the bylaws of the town, the laws of the Commonwealth and the town charter, and the reference book town meeting time have set out our rules for guidance. For your information, the rules we will follow are as follows. First, all non-voters, including press and children, uh, but accepting professional consultants advising town boards, must sit in the non-voter section in the left front bleacher. Over here. Ordinarily, only registered voters may address the meeting. However, I will assume the consent of the meeting to allow non-voters to speak, provided they are duly recognized and unless a timely objection is raised. Persons wishing to address the meeting must first identify themselves to the meeting by name and address each time when rising to speak. This traditional courtesy accords respect to those present and is an aid both to posterity and to those who keep our records uh, so that they may record your participation accurately. Further, any speakers representing a board, community group, or a client should make this clear to the meeting should they speak. After making a motion, an article sponsor will be allowed up to 10 minutes for a presentation. Sponsors of resolutions will be allowed up to five minutes. Sponsors need not use the full allotment of time, as the meeting has always had respect for the proverb, brevity is the soul of wit. All motions must be seconded, and no motion is in order until it has had a second. Members are encouraged to speak from the center microphone. I will attempt to recognize members in the order they arrive at the various mics throughout the room. Only after recognized by the moderator may a meeting member address the meeting. Shouting out from the floor or speaking without recognition are not customary. Show disrespect to your fellow voters and will not be allowed. Speakers from the floor are allowed five minutes on the first round of discussion on an article and three minutes on the second round. A speaker from the floor who wishes to address the meeting for a second time on an article must wait until persons who have not yet spoken have had their turn. Speakers, please confine your remarks to the motion that is on the floor. Please address only matters of general interest. Do not indulge in personal discussion or in any way attack the motives of any meeting member. You may ask questions of any official through the moderator. Be advised that an official may choose not to respond or may respond in a way that displeases you. Neither moderator nor meeting has the power to compel an answer, in which case your sole recourse is to draw your own conclusions from the response and vote accordingly. Should you tire of a debate, you may choose to suffer in silence, or you may offer the motion, I move the question. That motion terminates debate if approved by the meeting by a two-thirds vote. Please remember this important procedural point. You may not make a motion to move the question after making a speech. Please just make the motion and hold the speech. On voice votes, I listen to whether the motion passes or fails. If you question my call and my hearing, please rise. If seven or more voters rise, I will ask for a teller-counted vote. 
The tellers will count only those on the bleachers or floor seating sections. Persons standing away from the seating will not be counted. Section 20,150, subsection G of the town bylaws allows the moderator to declare two-thirds votes. If the moderator's declaration is immediately questioned by seven or more voters, we will take account. The acoustics in this room are very bad. Anyone having trouble hearing may feel free to move to a section where they think they can get a better sense of the sound. Please turn off your cell phones or at least set them to a non-ringing position. Uh, are there any honorary resolutions, Mr. Norton? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, we make this resolution tonight. Uh, it is bittersweet. If I could ask Bernice Brown to come up, a town clerk who is retiring, it's uh, bittersweet and that it's sweet and that we look forward and we, we join Bernice in her uh, quest for happiness and a restful retirement. It's bitter being in that we, we certainly will miss her, her expertise and her dedication uh, to the position of town clerk. She served that admirably for the past nine years and Bernice, the Board of Selectmen uh, and the entire town of Sitch would certainly appreciate and thank you. And having said that, I'd like to make this presentation in recognition of dedicated and distinguished service to the town of Sitch, Bernice Brown, town clerk, 2003-2012, given at this town meeting, April 2012. Bernice, thank you. Senator Hedlund and Representative Cantwell have joined us. If you could both stand and uh, say hello, please. Before proceeding to business, I just ask for a memorial moment of silence in honor of three of our officials who have passed since our last town meeting, uh, Dan Shea, Evelyn Ronstock, and Tom Snow. Thank you. Article 1, Compensation of Elected Officials. On the motion, Chairman Vignani. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town of Cook. Is that the right one? Yeah. I move that the town establish salaries and compensation of all elected officials as follows for the sum of $66,647. Selectmen, Chairman, and Legitimate Expenses, $1,500. Selectmen, Members, and Legitimate Expenses, to the total of $2,000 for four Selectmen. Assessors, Chairman, and Legitimate Expenses of $1,200, and Assessors, Members, and Legitimate Expenses in the amount of $800, and that's $400 per person and the town clerk personal services of $61,147. Seconded by Mr. Norton, discussion, Chairman Vignani. Thank you. Um, this is a standard article that uh, shows up at every meeting. The only difference to it is that the, uh, as we just um, acknowledged, is Bernice is retiring, so the salary for the clerk is going down to be in, uh, in the classification of someone at the at, at beginning of that process. 
Other than that, the selectmen and the assessor's salaries have not changed. The chairman of the advisory committee, Mr. Sandy. Uh, good evening. Um, I think uh, Tony explained it uh, thoroughly. It's uh, listed there in the booklets, the small variation due to um, the uh, change in uh, town clerk position. The advisory committee uh, recommends uh, approval of the motion. Discussion, uh, discussion from the floor. Seeing no one at the mics and there being no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? So voted and declared unanimous. Article 2 on the motion, Chairman Vignani. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, before I make a motion, I just want to make one quick uh, note. Um, I see most of you have these booklets in front of you that the advisory committee put together. Um, that's really the culmination of six months worth of work. It takes a lot of work to get that together, but it gives you a really good synopsis of everything that we'll be discussing tonight. And I just want to thank the advisory committee, Mark Sandman, and the rest of the group for, for preparing that. Um, that being said, I'll move on to article number two. Uh, the mo I move that the town reauthorize the following revolving accounts pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, uh, which shall be kept separate and apart from any other monies by the treasurer and which shall be deposited receipts received that may be spent only for those sources identified below under the source of funds without further appropriation during fiscal year 2013 and as identified below under use of funds and shall be expended under the direction of those so intended. Said, said annual amount expended for each revolving account shall not exceed the amount indicated below under the annual expenditure. And I'll read them all one, one by one. Are they as printed in the warrant? Yes. As printed in the warrant. As uh, per the warrant. Uh, Second, Mr. Harris, discussion, Chairman Pignan. Again, these are pretty standard um, articles that set up revolving funds for different services. Um, what this is, is really just an account where the money comes in and they can only be spent on that service that it identifies, including the senior center, planning board fees, food establishment, school bus and transportation to the school, beach sticker, and all these things where the town receives funds for these services. They cannot be cross-mingled into any other thing and it gets reconciled anyway. From the advisory committee, Chairman said. Um, once again, annual article, similar to number uh, one. Um, the advisory committee recommends approval of this motion. There being no one at the mics and no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article three, Chairman Vignan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town authorize the establishment of a flu vaccine revolving fund pursuant to Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44, Section 53 and a half, which shall be kept separate and apart from other monies by the treasurer, and which shall be deposited receipts received that may be spent only for those sources identified below under source of funds, without further, further appropriation during fiscal year 2013, and as identified below under use of funds, and shall be expended under the direction of those so indicated. Said annual amount expended from each revolving fund shall not exceed the amount indicated below under fiscal year 13 limit. And this is for the flu clinic fees. The use of the funds is for flu vaccines expended by the town nurse in a limit of $1,000. Second of Mr. Harris, discussion, Chairman Vignan. Thank you. Uh, uh, the previous um, article we met, we, we um, passed other revolving funds. It's just, this is just a new one that we need to add to the list, which is uh, receiving money and paying for getting flu vaccines. From the advisory committee, Ms. Carr. Good evening. The advisory board board voted 7 1 in favor of this article and recommends approval of the motion on the floor tonight. There being no one at the mics and no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Prior to uh, beginning action on articles 4 and 5, both uh, the chairman of the board of selectmen and the chairman of the advisory committee have asked for the chance to address the body concerning fiscal matters for the upcoming year. Uh, at this juncture, uh, Chairman Vignan. Thank you again, Mr. Moderator. Um, what I'd like to do now is just give a quick overview of the 2013 budget process. Um, this year has been an easier one than the past years. Um, 
I'll just go through the sources of funds, the uses of funds, and some of the reasons why it's been a little bit easier this year. As you all know, your property tax went up 2.5%, which is our main use of funds. Uh, new growth has stayed level over the last two years, and again, we're comparing all this stuff to last year in the amount of two hundred eighty-five dollars or $290,000. Um, state aid stayed relatively level, um, a slight decrease of about $70,000. Local receipts are projected to be level with last year. Um, maybe a slight decrease of about $70,000. And shared expenses, although they increased about $350,000, typically they increase you know, well over $500,000. Um, so when you add all that stuff together, the, um, the net net that comes down to the departments is, is a better year than it has been in the past. Um, one of the biggest effects on the budget, though, are the effect of the override that was passed last year. The effects of the override were, for the school department, we were able to stop three consecutive years of having to lay off teachers and other administration in the, in the department. Um, the effects of the town from the override money that was passed allowed us to help our public safety departments, including the police department and the fire department. And lastly, um, the major use of the funds on the town side were really uh, $500,000, of which $400,000 was set aside to um, improve the town's infrastructure and $100,000 to help repair buildings. Um, overall, the budgets for the town and the school increased by 2.3, 2.4%. Um, in past years, it's actually gone down. So this year was um, a little less tedious than years in the past. Um, what I'd like to do is just take a quick second and talk about um, some of the major concerns of the town administrator and the board. Over the past several years and probably decades, the focus of our budget has been primarily on the operations of the town. And what has happened to some extent is the assets of the town have been neglected. Our equipment, our buildings, our infrastructure have not been getting the attention that they need. Capital expenditures in the past have usually been done on an emergency basis. The vehicle won't pass inspection, the roof is leaking, the car won't start. This has resulted in our assets in our town becoming old, outdated, and frankly, worn down. For the past two years, and in the upcoming years, we're trying to address this concern. Some of the examples of things that we've done in the last two years are, one, we added an IT director. No saying right there. Um, and he has really taken control of our computers and our, our systems there, and he's updated and stabilized and secured our computer systems and our databases. Another thing, as I mentioned before, is the town is committed to allocating hundreds of thousands of dollars each year into the infrastructure of the town. In the past, to fix our roads and our, well, very little has gone to our seawalls, um, but it's either done through grants or federal money or the money that we get from the state for Chapter 90. The town is committed to allocating this override money year after year again, and they've done it again this year. Um, another thing uh, of note is the DPW department. As projects occur in town, they take a proactive stance, so when a road is open and it's in an area where we know the water and the sewer lines are not good, that we go in there and we replace them then so that we can save money and, and improve the infrastructure at a lower cost. So all these things are in the mindset of what we've been doing. This kind of transitioned us to the article that we're about to discuss, chapter, I mean, excuse me, article number four, which is the capital planning. I want to take a second and, and thank the Capital Planning Committee. Jimmy Thimmer's right there. He was the, the chair of it. Um, these people took the time and reviewed every single item of every single department's request. Um, the booklet that they went through was probably this thick, and they spent many, many hours going over this. Um, last year, the town administrator implemented a comprehensive process, process for the uh, capital planning. It's very detailed. It's very organized and it attempts to look at all items from all departments in an objective manner. This year, there are 24 items that we'll discuss tonight, totaling about $2 million of expenditures and about $5.9 million of an authorization. And I'll talk about that further in a minute. Um, what I'd like to do is break the capital plan into three different groups. The first group, um, and again, this is article number four I've transitioned to, uh, the first group are 12 items that relate to the enterprise funds in the town. And these items are not funded with your property taxes. They're not funded from the general fund. They are funded from the operations of whatever 
um, enterprise fund they're associated with. In the case of tonight's meeting, they're the water department, the sewer department, and the waterways department. They include the funding of additional projects that we've been going on for years, for instance, I&I &I projects, um, the infiltration of water into our system that um, needs to be processed, that's really rainwater. Um, and they include the replacement of vehicles that all are within the budget constraints of that enterprise fund. And every one of these enterprise funds budget is at least at a break even status. So that is the first uh, 12 items totaling $825,000. Uh, the second group of items are nine departmental items totaling $535,000. <coughs> um, these items are items from specific departments like the fire department, the DPW department, um, the accounting department, or whatever the item has to be. Um, these are, uh, includes vehicles that are either scheduled for replacement or will significantly improve a process. These items are either funded through two, two ways, either through free cash, which is uh, money that, we're, that we accumulate through operating walls of town, kind of like a, a retained earnings or net income, and, or they're uh, funded through borrowing. If you have to borrow for the money, then it eventually affect the operation in future years when you pay for it. The last group of items are three items that I want to discuss individually. Um, and these are, you know, three important items for the town and, and one of the main things for the discussion tonight. Um, the first one is a $285,000 um, item to complete the school technology plan. This is a multi-year project. The school has already spent over $500,000 on this plan and this is the final year of it or the next year of it. Um, where in the past they've really worked on uh, improving and building a fiber optic network. And this year, the plan includes uh, an addition of uh, network switches, adding wireless technology, and purchasing new computers. So that is uh, definitely a step in the right direction for our school system. The second item, which is uh, one of the two probably more controversial or more discussive one, is a $375,000 ar article for the design, engineering, business and site analysis, surveying, appraisal, cost estimates for the improvement and design and reuse of some of our major public buildings. That's quite a mouthful, I'll try and say it in English now. Um, we're putting a uh, plan together, which has been discussed for years now, um, to deal with some of the inadequacies of our buildings in town. And uh, we've discussed about this in selectmen's meetings, but a preliminary plan that we're putting together our preliminary model would be doing something like moving town hall to gates, moving the police and fire station in some sort of joint capacity up to North Situate, which will allow better service to the West End and to Minot, and taking um, the middle school and building a new middle school where the uh, town hall is right now. Um, these buildings are very old. Town hall is 53 years old. Gates is 96 years old. The, um, hopefully, the cost of the school portion of this, we've applied for money through the state, through the MSBA, and typically they fund between 40 and 50 percent of a project. So that one piece of the component will um, hopefully be funded by help from the state. Um, uh, a number of consultants will be used for this. There's been a lot of discussion about is this a feasibility study. Um, we did the Habib report, and is this just another copy of that? Um, that's not the case. We're going to hire a lot of consultants to come in and actually give us answers. We're not going to get a list back from people that says, do this, do this, do this. We're going to find out whether a middle school can fit on the land over by the town hall. We're going to find out what it costs to build a joint police station, where it can actually go, what the setbacks have to be, and all this sort of stuff. And our goal is to move quickly on this project so that by the next town meeting, we can actually have options to come and bring before the town to see if they want to proceed in this manner. There's been questions about how did we come up with the $375,000. We guessed. We don't know what it will cost. If it costs less than that, we'll put the money back in, in the general fund. If it costs more than that, then we'll come before you and ask for more. But what we believe is that the $375,000 will allow us to make a significant progress on figuring out if this project will work. The last item that I'm going to assess, and then I'll sit down, is 
the $5.9 million authorization for an energy savings contract. Another one of the big items today. The town has undergone an audit of all of the town buildings. And we found that there's several million dollars worth of uh, energy savings initiatives that have been identified. The book is somewhere over there. So we have this huge report, $10 million worth of projects. Um, what we hope to do is partner with this company called Amoresco um, to have them come in and um, implement these improvements. The twist to this is that Amoresco guarantees the savings in your utilities. And what they do is they actually prepare a financial analysis of every project so that you can take the expenditures of the cost of doing the project and match it with the savings that they've guaranteed so that essentially the project pays for itself. So for example, if we need to replace the windows at Wampata and it costs $90,000 and it's going to save us $30,000 in electricity every year, then we'd amortize the $90,000 over three years, reap $30,000 worth of savings every year, and after three years, replacing the windows will have paid for itself. If, say, one year the, the savings are only $28,000, then this company has guaranteed that they will make the savings that they say, um, make it up. So, um, so it seems like a good, a good initiative. What we're trying to do is have minimal or no impact on the cash flow so that there's no impact on our operating budget. So we don't have to uh, deal with laying off any positions or cutting anything else to fund this project. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm almost done. Um, the program includes schools and town buildings. Um, it does not include any buildings that may be demolished in the previous article that I just talked to you about. So if we're planning on knocking down Town Hall, we're not going to go replace the windows. Um, there's no time frame on the completion. So it's not like we have to do $5.9 million worth of projects in one year or two years or what have you. And there's no minimum annual amount to spend. So it's kind of somewhat of an open contract to get this stuff done. But of course, we want to get it done because it pays for itself. Um, this article gives the Board of Selectmen the ability to authorize up to $5.9 million worth of projects for a specific list of projects that are in this report. And it will allow us to initiate these projects both prudently and quickly, and it will give us flexibility to move forward with this stuff, as opposed to ha having the constraints of the timeline of town meeting dictate what projects can move forward with. Okay, I'm going to stop now. I've gone over the general budget and uh, article number four. Mark? Chairman Sanders. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Mark Sandem, member of the advisory, head of the chair of the advisory committee. Um, rather than go through and um, repeat a lot of the, the facts that outlined by Tony, what you have there in your advisory booklet. I thought the point here in my discussion was to take this more like on a, on a, on a theme. Um, I view this as another step forward for the town. Um, picking up on the momentum of the last couple of years of our budgets and the improvement in the town. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone here what's been going on at a global level, federal level, state level over the past four years. It's been difficult. While some signs of improvement are there, depending on who you talk to and whatever the source is, I think the fact remains that, yes, there are difficult times still ahead. And a lot of the allocations and the items here in the budget are big items. But where are we going? Um, as we've seen, eventually, a lot of the impacts from a macro level, they work their way down here. We're affected at our, at our city and state budgets from the state level. The monies we receive here, it impacts upon us individually. It impacts upon us as taxpayers. And we've seen that reflected in, the, in, our, in our statements. For the past few years, the state funding support that we've come to expect 
as Tony mentioned before, is relatively flat. I don't think there's anyone promising that that's going to change. Increases can't be predicted or expected. We have several big ticket items still on the budget, pension, health care, although there are means and mechanisms today to kind of mitigate some of those expenses, they're still big items and they will be there despite everything that's being proposed here in the capital budget. So where do we go? I think in the last couple of budget cycles, the town has taken a very proactive approach in managing the challenges in a prudent process through budget preparation and planning, commitments and dedication of all the staff and operational managers at both the school and the municipal side, and to support everybody that's here in town. And I think that precisely is demonstrated as far as support by the town in last year's override. As a result, today, key financial performance indicators such as our stabilization fund, free cash position, our debt rating remain very strong. And today, we have now a solid foundation upon which to move forward on that. As I see it, the FY13 budget and the Warren articles presented today tonight support that continued mission. Some key items in there I'd like to speak to are one, although I'm going to repeat some of what Tony had mentioned, our schools. All the schools, Ford Elementary, Gates, South Shore Vogue Tech, the high school, continue to deliver us an exceptional product and service. Well staffed, due to the override, focus on improving technology use, improving trade skills, and continuing to implement curriculum changes that focus on improving student achievements. Number two, improving our capital infrastructure and operational efficiency gets right to the heart of many of the items in Article 4. DPW, for instance, is addressing critical needs today, monies that we're putting into roads today that we've all seen, seawalls that we've seen today, water infiltration, don't mention that, expanding sewer capacity to support areas where it's needed in town, either for support purposes or environmental reasons, or they're working together with Renewal Energy Committee in leading us towards a goal of more self-sustaining energy future. The wind turbine is a prime example that we see spinning and the upcoming solar array. These are critical items taken today and now we need to build upon them going forward. Tonight, as Tony mentioned, we'll be discussing the ESCO project. I think this gives us the unique opportunity to partner now with industry experts who can help us improve the efficiency and value of our committed long-term capital assets here in town at both the school and the municipal level. Supporting this project as well, our critical support, <coughs> excuse me, um, a critical support cast, which includes a facilities manager position whose role it is will be to maintain, assess, and help our town manage its facilities which at last count is upwards of $150 million. Someone needs to help us manage these assets, especially if we're going to take future investments. Along these lines, we'll also be discussing to conduct a detailed assessments and studies on those selected town and school buildings for either the renovation or the construction. Also in the town budget that you see here today, I think there's further use, proof of further commitment by the town in protecting our natural resources, many of those items which will be addressed in specific articles uh, under the CPC. Also, this budget recognizes the increasing needs in various departments and changes in needs of various other departments. For example, information technology and veterans benefits. The budget presented to you this evening is well planned, it's well thought out, it's understandable, and it's balanced. 
which is probably more than you can say for the federal budget. It's also goal-oriented, service-oriented, to support everybody that's here. And again, more than numbers, it's about the school municipal staff who support and benefit all 18,000 members and residents in town. On behalf of the advisory committee, I'd like to thank all the various school and municipal departments and staff for their hard work and dedication this year and next. A special appreciation to some other departments, Council on Aging, Recreation and Beautification, who provide, in my opinion, a kind of mind-boggling list of services, many done by dedicated volunteers for the benefits of everybody in town at minimal cost. Those are kind of my comments and thoughts regarding Articles 4 and 5. Um, in closing, um, I just wanted to extend a personal thanks to a couple of members on our board. We probably won't get to it later in the meeting, so I'm going to do it now. And I'd like to thank members Bob DiLorenzo and Kevin Dolan, who have served six and three years respectively on this committee. Past two years, Bob was the advisory committee before chairman, excuse me, before I assumed this role. And the board is thankful for his leadership in years in leading this, this committee. Um, also, Gene Martin for serving for upwards of five years as secretary for our committee. Thank you both. Um, So I, I speak for the committee when I'm speaking about our, our two members here that are moving on. But there are other openings and other committees and, and I guess I wanted to put a plug in and encourage everybody here who's taking an active role in town meeting um, to participate in one of the committees that may interest them. Um, in the back of every, not in the back of our advisory report, there's an application. Um, so if you're ever interested, you refer to that and it'll give you, give you direction. So I, I encourage everybody there. Um, with that said, uh, thank you again for last year, the support, and hope you enjoy the show. All right, we're going to go to work on Article 4, and here's what we're going to do. If you could all turn over to page 15 of your advisory committee report, you'll be able to follow along. I'm going to ask the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen to make to uh, read off all the motions for Article 4. There'll be quite a bit of reading involved. Just let him get through that. Once he's done reading that, I'm going to go through each of the items listed in the report as A through X, and I will ask people to put holds on any item that they want discussed. Any item that is not held will be voted without further discussion, and then we will return to the held items. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you may begin with the motions. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town appropriate and borrow or transfer from available funds in the Treasury in accordance with Massachusetts General Law Chapter 44, Section 7 and 8, and any other enabling authority, the following sums of money totaling $7,920,500 for the purpose of funding the cost of the fiscal year 2013 capital improvement plan submitted in, in accordance with Section 6-6 .6 of the Situate Home Rule Charter, as provided in the warrant printed in this meeting, and further authorize the Treasurer with the approval of the Selectman to borrow said sums. Item A, I move to transfer from free cash the sum of $35,000 for the replacement of the asphalt apron at the fire station headquarters. B, I move to transfer from free cash the sum of $30,000 for purchase of a defibrillator for the fire department. C, I move to transfer from free cash the sum of $45,000 to refurbish the rescue pumper for the fire department. D, I move to appropriate the sum of $285,000 to complete phase two of the school district technology plan for improvement of networks, operations, workstations, and wireless access, and to further authorize the treasurer to, with the approval of the selectmen to borrow said sum. E, I move to transfer from free cash the amount of $92,500 for the purchase of a new school bus for the school department. 
F, I move to transfer for free cash the sum of $60,000 for the purpose of replacing carpeting at Hadley and Cushing schools. G, I move to transfer from free cash the sum of $55,000 for the purchase of a one-ton dump truck for the highway department. F, uh, excuse me, H, I move to appropriate the sum of $5,900,000 pursuant to check, uh, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 25 for the purpose of entering into a guaranteed energy saving performance contract with a qualified energy service company, ESCO, to improve the energy and efficiency of the town and school buildings and to further authorize the treasurer with the approval of the selectmen to borrow said sum. I, I move to transfer the free cash, the sum of $89,000 for the purpose of purchasing a gang mower for the public grounds department. J, I move to appropriate the sum of $375,000 for the purpose of conducting assessments, analysis, design services, and or engineering for selected town and school buildings, either for renovation or construction, and to further authorize the treasurer with the approval of the selectmen to borrow said sum. K, I move to transfer from free cash the sum of $40,000 for the purpose of purchasing an asphalt reclamation system for the highway department. L, I move to transfer from free cash the sum of $89,000 for the purchase of up to three DPW vehicles after completion of an audit to determine the appropriate replacement vehicles warranted. M, I move to transfer from the sewer retained earnings the sum of $200,000 for the purpose of conducting a town's infiltration inflow reduction program. N, I move to transfer from the sewer retained earnings the sum of $82,500, let me try that again, $82,500 for the purpose of the rehabilitation of Sand Hills Pump Station. O, I move to transfer from the sewer re retained earnings the sum of $32,000 for the purpose of replacing a pickup truck for the sewer department. P, I move to appropriate the sum of $100,000 for the purpose of continuing the water department strategic capital plan to replace aged and broken water main pipes and, the fur and further authorize the treasurer with the approval of selectmen to borrow said sum. Q, I move to transfer from water retained earnings the sum of $15,000 for ongoing replacement of fire hydrants. R, I move to appropriate the sum of $128,500 for the purpose of purchasing an emergency backup generator at well 19 in the water department and to further authorize the treasurer with the approval of the selectmen to borrow said sum. S, I move to appropriate the sum of $100,000 for the purpose of purchasing a backhoe for the water department and to further authorize the treasurer with the approval of the selectmen to borrow said sum. T, I move to appropriate the sum of $50,000 from the water retained earnings for the purpose of continuing the town water meter replacement program. U, I move to appropriate the sum of $32,000 from the water retained earnings for the purpose of purchasing a pickup truck for the water department. V, I move to appropriate the sum of $30,000 from the water Ways retained earnings for the purpose of funding the first phase of a two-year dredging project under the North and C Street Bridge at the mouth of the South River. W, I move to appropriate the sum of $25,000 from the waterways retained earnings for the purpose of rehabilitating the South River launch located on the North and South Rivers. And finally, X, I move to appropriate the sum of $30,000 from the waterways retained earnings for the purpose of purchasing an environmental pump out boat for use by the harbor master. Seconded by Mr. Murray, does either the Board of Selectmen or the Advisory Committee have anything further to add by way of recommendation on this? Ms. Carpenter? <coughs> Good evening. For the Advisory Committee, um, I think it's important just to make a few notes. This is a very daunting list of items that uh, we have before us this year. Uh, but the Capital Planning Committee went through a very extensive review. And if you take out the ESCO project for $5.9 million, it really narrows down to about $2 million worth of investment. And you will see that most items are to be funded through free cash or earnings from our retained earnings accounts. Um, it is the goal of the town to try to pay for as many of these projects with the cash that we have in hand and limit our borrowing and um, not put any more further stress on our debt service. Um, the Capital Planning Committee reviewed over $8 million worth of items, <clears throat> excuse me, 
just for fiscal 13 alone, excluding the ESCO project. So that should demonstrate to the town the variety and depth of needs um, that are required to sustain and improve our infrastructure. It's a long article, so without further ado, the advisory board voted unanimously in support of the entire article and recommends approval of all the motions on the table tonight. All right, members. Uh, looking at page 15 of the report, I'll call each letter. If you want a discussion on the item that I call, please say in a loud voice, hold. And then we will vote everything that isn't held, and then we'll return to the held items for discussion. A. B. C. D. E. F. G. H. Hold on H. I. J. Hold on J. K. L. M. N. O. P. Q. R. S. T. U. V. W. X. The only items that were held were H and J. All those in favor of acting on the motions made for the unheld item signified by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared a unanimous vote. We return now to a discussion of item H, energy savings contract. Uh, the person who held it, uh, would you like to come to the mic? Gentleman coming up on the right hand side of the room. Mr. Moderator, my name is James Hunt, 66 Manlot Road. I have a couple of questions, and the form of the questions will depend on the answers to the first couple. So if I might engage in a dialogue with the uh, chairman, with your permission, Mr. Moderator, and through you. Go ahead, Mr. Hunt. ESCO uh, is claiming to guarantee a return. I assume that guarantee will be in the form of some surety bond or, or otherwise. The amount that ESCO is guaranteeing is $2 million roughly. Is that correct? They guarantee the savings to the utility bills. So which, is list, which is listed here at $2.091 million. Right. Cost of the project is $5.9 million of which more than half, 3.2 million, is to be funded from turbine and solar array revenue, neither of which have yet generated any revenue as far as I, I know. And in Article 3, we dedicated that revenue to the subsidizing of town electricity costs. Is that not a conflict? They, <clears throat> they're two completely separate entities completely separate activities. The, the money that we eventually make, and it's spinning now, so we're making money now, um, from the solar array and from the windmill have nothing at all to do with this project. They'll all help us save on our energy bill, but they are not commingled. Then where is the turbine and solar revenue coming from? That will come from National Grid. So that is, in fact, the energy savings it will be energy savings in terms of price, but not in terms of usage. What this program will do is actually reduce our usage. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, that, uh, my name is Al Banger. I'm the director of public works, and I recognize you, Mr. Banger. How did you? Go ahead. Um, the in, in the advisory booklet on page 22, that I believe is what you're referring to. Yes. The the ESCO project, what we did in, in discussing with the advisory committee was put, put together a proposed way to fund this. In, in fact, what happens, the ESCO project will be fully funded by the savings that they will generate. 
In the, on page 22, where you refer to the energy savings of $2 million, that's $2 million just in the first eight years. It's projected there will be a 20-year savings that will come out of this program, uh, and, the, and the capital cost will be spread over that 20 years. So in earlier discussions and when this book was, was printed, it was an idea of combining solar revenue as well as rebates, as well as savings from the project. But the project can be fully funded and would be fully funded by the return of the savings from the projects that are put in place. And over the 20 years, that savings is $8.7 million. That's not in your booklet. But that's what the ESCO would be guaranteeing us were we to do the $5.9 million worth of projects. Through you, how, how is the form of that guarantee to be presented? That's that's a uh, a financial guarantee um, on the um, bond of the, on the company. In fact, I could invite our ESCO partner down to discuss that if you'd like, if the chairman would so choose. And it's moderator allows. Hmm? Do you want to have someone else speak? Does he answer your question? That, that, that answers the, the question, as long as the form of guarantee is uh, better than the one Quincy had with, with Yes, it's a, it's a written guarantee, and it's, uh, it's also uh, overseen by the Department of Energy Resources, so we have the state on our side to help with this whole program. All right, and just to, just to clarify and, and end the discussion, at least on my part, there is no conflict between this article and Article 3, is that correct? The article about the uh, revolving funds. Yes, that's correct. There is no conflict. Correct, there is no conflict. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. There is no one else standing at the mic. <coughs> Approval of this motion would require a two thirds vote. All those in favor of the motion made by Chairman Vignani signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Uh, so voted and declared a two-thirds vote. If any seven persons wish to challenge my determination, you may rise and do so now. No one is standing. The next held item was item J. Lady at the center mic. Jen Morrison, 60 Morning Highlander Road. Go ahead. Um, I did not hold it, but I wanted to get up to uh, speak in support of it. I hope that all of us here tonight would uh, support this part of the capital plan. Everyone here tonight, all residents, students, parents, seniors, basically everybody in this room will benefit from this. We face several issues as a community with respect to aging facilities and infrastructure. It's critical that we look carefully at where we are today before making any decisions about what we do tomorrow to sustain and evolve the services for all the residents. These decisions will contribute to the future value of our homes and, more importantly, the quality of life within our community for years to come. As a result, it's in our best interest to have as much information as we can before committing to future plans. Now, this vote doesn't commit us to doing it, anything as a town now to funding capital improvements. Voting in favor tonight just simply provides funding for the town to do proper research and preparation to inform a comprehensive town-wide facilities plan. This is sorely needed. As, you know, just to highlight further and to reiterate what's been said, the Senior Center was built in 1938 and is horribly inadequate. The police station built in 1959. Gates is coming up on its 100 year birthday. Think of the money we're wasting each year to keep these old buildings. Gates alone costs $150,000 a year to keep, and that's four times more than any other school in our town. If this item does not pass tonight, it cannot be considered again until the special town meeting this fall further delaying efforts to improve a school, a senior center, or any other town facility. We do not want any further delays. 
please vote yes to support the $375,000 from capital planning. Thank you. Lady to my left. Deborah Burke, 202 Old Oak and Bucket Road. Um, I did put a hold on this article. I wanted to point out to the meeting that we voted in a $2.2 million override last year, most of which was supposed to be for the schools. We found out some months later that accidentally there was actually an extra four to 500000 that you guys didn't need, but you decided that you wouldn't give it back to us. You'd offer us 150000 out of that. Okay, so I'm wondering really what's going on with the budgeting process, and now you want us to spend almost $400,000 on a study, not on actually fixing anything. I have no issues with replacing the Gates School, fixing the Gates School. This article is not about the Gates School. This article is about a $400,000 study of town facilities, and I feel that that's an awful lot of money to spend on a bunch of consultants. There's a lot of contractors in town who'd be happy to do some work on the buildings. Would probably be willing to give you estimates for free. I don't know. I just think it's a lot of money to spend on another study. Thank you. Sir. Scott Greenbaum, 40 Dane Road. Uh, I support the idea of studying our buildings, um, but this study is predicated on placing a middle school where town hall and the police station is. This town spent a couple, some money two years ago having a resource delineation of the pond in the front yard that, of the school here, and it was found to be a vernal pool. Unfortunately, that makes it very difficult to do this work, and I'm a member of the Conservation Commission. So therefore, if the premise is wrong of the plan, then we probably should be reviewing whether we should be spending money on the plan. Um, the other thing is there's talk about putting the police and fire station up in North Situate. Most police and fire stations are in the center of town, which is here. So if the premise of the study is flawed, then the study will be flawed and therefore it will not be a good spending of our money. We do need to have a study, and we do need to start out with the right footing before we go ahead with it and consider all our facts, especially the facts that we've already spent money for consultants to find for us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, to Senator Mike, then Mr. Vignano. Hi, Mark Bissell, 28 Captain English at Lane Situate. Um, question, if I might, first, Mr. Moderator. The buildings to be studied include a vast array of the 50 buildings we own. Is that correct? You know how many buildings it would be in the study? Go ahead, Mr. Yes. Can you tell us how many would be in the study? Oh, how many? I'm sorry. Um, so we're going to look at it, at all of the different departments in the town. I mean, the thought of moving to Gates is that there's a lot more space there than there is in Town Hall. So what it gives us the opportunity is to centralize a lot of the departments that are outlined. Um, I don't know what they are. I mean, clearly, you have to do a study to find the answers. You just can't hire a builder to go build a middle school. Um, you know, somebody has to go in, and they're not going to give us a hit list back that says, you know, hire somebody else to do this. They're going to give us concrete answers that says, if you want to put a school in this campus, it has to go here because the parking requirements are here, the setbacks are here, this is there, and we're actually going to get a plan. In terms of how many buildings, I don't know, but there's certainly operations in the high school that could be moved to, um, recreation could move to gates along with the rest of the departments, the water department could move, the DPW departments could move, the highway department, council on aging could be considered, the library could be considered. I mean, any one of the outside departments that are outside of town hall right now will be considered as soon as we figure out what the footprint and the capacity of gates will be to go into that facility. Great, thank you. And a follow-on comment would just be that um, when I look around, we've got 50 plus buildings in, this, in the town, and I think it would be great for us to have kind of a more comprehensive master plan. I think in the last couple of years, we've done things at the WPA building, we've talked about Pier 44, we've talked about the senior center, we've talked about schools. 
So I'm very supportive of getting our arms around the bigger picture so we can look at a prioritized list rather than thinking about the one-off situation as mentioned earlier, or emergency repairs. I think if you put it into the context of your own home, you know, do you do an addition, do you build a driveway, what do you do first, where does it come from? So I encourage us to go forward with the, with the proposal to get that plan in place. There's probably some buildings that don't need to be around. We could look at moving those around. And I just feel better having a plan in place. So I urge everyone to support the plan to figure out what we do next and look forward to a year from now. We have some concrete initiatives in place to vote on. Thank you. There being no one else with the mic, action on this motion requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of the motion as made signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Oh. So voted, declared a two-thirds vote. If any seven people challenge my determination, please rise and do so now. No one is rising. The vote is confirmed. It passes by a two-thirds vote. Article 5. What we'll do on this motion is we'll allow Mr. Vignani to make the main motion. We'll get the advisory committee recommendation. And then, as we do each year, we will go through the budget and ask for holds on the different departmental line items. And if you turn to pages 24 through 28 in your advisory committee report, you'll be able to follow along. Mr. Vignani. Great. Um, before I jump into that, just a quick comment on the budget. Um, I want to thank um, I want to thank uh, the town administrator and all the department heads for uh, presenting all the volumes of data that they did to us and to the advisory committee. Um, the town administrator has a very challenging role um, in the budget process to maintain the current level of services while also trying to implement the strategic plans and the priorities of the board. In most cases, she has to make cuts in some areas to make money available in other areas. Um, obviously, this is all within the confines of the general budget. She's given a number that she has to make and has to make it work just like the school department does with their area. Um, this number comes from the forecasting committee and the town administrator. It's not an easy task. Um, this year, I'm happy to say that the level of services are being kept at the same level. There's some increases and decreases. But overall, the level of service will stay the same for the town. Um, there are five items that I want to just mention very quickly that stand, stood out to me. The first one is under veteran services. Um, with, the added, uh, with the addition of our veterans agent, Donald Knapp, over here, and the advisory council, I see a lot of the members out in the crowd here, um, we expect our funding for our benefits uh, for the veterans to increase, and if so, uh, increase the budget there. Our police department went up, and that's because we're adding two police officers to the force. Our, DP, uh, our DP, DPW department budget increased, and that's due to the increase of fuel, some additional equipment, but the majority of it is the addition of a facilities manager. The town, as we've mentioned earlier, has 55 buildings with a total value over $150 million. You add the ESCO projects to it that we just passed. You add the um, restructuring of the buildings that we just passed. You add the green projects that we're working on. Um, and then you just look at the age and the condition of our current buildings, and you see that there's quite a lot of work to be done in that area. And it's not something that you can just pile on somebody else in the DPW department. This is a top priority of the town administrator. She has the support of the Board of Selectmen and the Advisory Committee. And um, it is a necessity in order for us to be successful with the two items that you just passed. The last thing that I'll mention are the shared expenses. I mentioned those earlier. They went up $350,000. Insurance went up, retire went up, other pension and employee benefits went up, and uh, we had an increase in, in uh, attendance at South Shore Road Tech in that one. So that's the, the general summary of the budget. I'll now make a motion. Move the town raise and appropriate $57,519,486. And transfer from the Golf Enterprise Fund the sum of $49,597, and from the Wastewater Enterprise the sum of $196,857, and from the Water Department Enterprise the sum of $293,521, and from the Transfer Station Enterprise the sum of $128,365 
and from the Waterways Enterprise, the sum of $91,185, and from the Title V Assessments, the sum of $6,858, and from the Debt Premium Reserve, the, fund of, uh, the sum of $11,437, and from the PEG Access Cable Grant, the sum of $74,322 to the general fund, and the sum of $54,472 from the Massachusetts School Building Assistant Reserve, totaling $58,372,100, and for the purpose of funding personal services and expenses for town operations and as may be necessary for fiscal year commencing July 1, 2012 as printed in the advisory book. Seconded by Mr. Harris. Discussion. Uh, we've already had it from the Board of Selectmen from the Advisory Committee, Mr. Sand. If you have any comments you wish to offer. Um, I don't have any other further comments to add other than the opening remarks uh, made earlier. Um, I think many of you were flipping through some of the notes there that Tony was going through a lot in the motion. Um, those were items that uh, we used our um, enterprise fund uh, indirect costs uh, that he was going through that offset the number. So the, dip the differences that you see, it ultimately totals up, but Tony was going through a lot of numbers which ultimately lead to the, the number you have in your advisory booklet. So the motion was a little bit longer than what we have in the, the booklet there. The advisory committee recommends uh, approval of this motion. All right, starting on the excellently clear advisory committee booklet on page 24, I'll go through the uh, head line item account numbers. If you want to discuss an item, please say in a loud, clear voice, hold, and we will return to that item for discussion. Anything that is not held will be voted, and then we'll return for the held items. Okay. Starting at line 122, Board of Selectmen. Do I hear a hold? Yes, no? I'm calling that a no. Line 123, Town Administrator. I heard a hold. Line 131, Advisory Committee. Line 132, Reserve Fund. Line 135, Town Accountant. Line 141, Assessors. Line 145, Treasurer Collector. Line 149, Administration. Line 155, Information Technology. Line 158, Tax Foreclosures. Line 159, Cable Television. Line 161, Town Clerk. Line 171, Conservation. Line 175, Planning Board. Line 176, Zoning Board of Appeals. Line 192, Property Liability Insurance. Line 210, Police. Line 220, Fire. Line 241, Inspections. Line 292, Animal Shelter. Anim, uh, line 295, Shellfish. Line 300, School Committee. Line 310, Re uh, South Shore Regional School. Line 400, Public Works. Did I hear a hold? Okay, if you're going to say hold, oh, please say it nice and loud. It's hard to hear it here, that's why. Okay, so I heard a hold on Public Works. Line 423, Snow and Ice. Line 424, Street Lights and Beacons. Line 510, Board of Health. Line 541, Council on Aging. Line 543, Veterans Benefits Services. Line 549, Commission on Disabilities. Line 610, Library. Line 630, Recreation. Line 650, Beautification. Line 691, Historical Buildings. Line 720, Debt and Interest. Line 910, 
non-contributory pensions. Line 911, Plymouth County Retirement. Line 912, Workers' Compensation. Line 913, Unemployment Insurance. Line 914, Contributory Group Insurance. Line 916, and I want to get a look at the person who holds this one, Federal Taxes. And that's it. So, we have holds on Line 123, Town Administrator, and Public Works, Line 400. Did I miss anything? All right. All those in favor of approving the non-held item signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? So voted and declared unanimous. Returning now to line 123, uh, who do we have? Ma'am. Laura Thaxter, 175 Old Open Bucket. Uh, this was more of a question. In looking at um, some of the budget materials that were prepared earlier on and the proposed budget, it looked like there was a significant increase um, from 345000 to 420000 Additionally, looking back at prior years, this budget has gone from 210000 sorry, in 2010 it was 224000 Last year it was 360000 and now it's 420000 And I just wanted to get a better understanding of the reason for that increase. It's probably the only line item I've seen that's increased almost double uh, over those two years. On the question, Chairman Mignogna. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the reason why some of the, the years have changed is because we've reclassed expenses going into different accounts. That's somewhat of it. Um, the reason why the recent increase is in um, the light item that jumped up from 80 something thousand to 160,000, that is the um, funds available for the fire union contract COLA increase. Um, so those are, are being um, accrued there. Um, as we wait for the final decision on that, uh, that contract to sign. Uh, if I could just make one comment, I think for those of us looking at the budget, it would be helpful on the forecast to go back more than just the prior year. I personally find it helpful not only to be looking at 2012 and 13, but also a little further backwards as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there being no one else at the mics, all those in favor of line 123, Town Administrator, as presented, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? So voted and declared a majority. We turn now to line item 400. Is that this stroke I see over there? Oh, you recognize me, okay. Lady to my right. Nita Strode, white on her way. A year ago, I talked about this item, so I'm gonna talk about it again, and it was voted down. I will have a question once I make my comments. Uh, my question for my request would be, the uh, selectmen all supported this article, the advisory committee all supported the article, uh, with the accept exception of one. My question would be, who was not in favor of this article this time? The other question, or I would expect that each of the selectmen would discuss why they voted in favor of this article, as would the advisory committee members, because Last year, the tax-paying citizens voted against this article. My question would be, weren't you all listening what the taxpayers said? And now you're back again. Um, this was voted no, as I said a year ago. Three months after town meeting, the DPW director, and one of his employees uh, paid a visit to the advisory committee requesting this position again.
Three months after we voted no, the town charter, <coughs> pardon me, uh, states that the town administrator shall have full jurisdiction over the rental and use of town facilities except schools. The town administrator shall keep a full and complete inventory of all property of the town, both real and personal. The bylaws state <clears throat> under 20300 town administrator, he, well this has changed now, but it states, he shall be responsible for the maintenance and repair of all public buildings except schools and historical sites. He shall be responsible for the maintenance of school grounds and public lands. If there is a new facility manager appointed, I believe we're going to have to change the town charter because the charter specifically states that the town administrator oversees this. I do recall last year Anthony Antonelli voted against this on the advisory committee and he stated at that time that was their department. He did that for 32 years and he voted, that's why he had voted against. I would like to start and ask who on the advisory committee this year was not in favor of this. Well, well hold on. Uh, I heard uh, two different groups of questions there. One, a legal question about whether it's lawful to set up this position, and I'm going to ask town council to address that, and then if uh, individual officials wish to uh, explain how and why they voted, I'll let them do that, uh, and you have one minute left. So, council? Excuse me, my one minute means when I'm talking, not when anyone's responding, right? Well, I guess that's going to be for the moderator to figure out, but I agree with you this time. So, yes. James, to me, town council, uh, the speaker is correct that the administrator has responsibility for town buildings, but that does not address how the appropriations are organized or how the various personnel um, are put into various departments. So the budgetary appropriation could be in any of the areas that are ultimately under the uh, town administrator, um, and there's no legal requirement that the budget be organized to have each of those positions in her uh, lineup. All right, and now uh, to the officials, the chairman's closest to the mic, he can start. If any other official wishes to say something briefly, I'll recognize you. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, let me start by answering the question where you, you insinuated that the, the selectmen weren't following the lead of the prior meeting. Uh, I'd rather we didn't use words like insinuate. Okay. Well, let's just keep it. I didn't insinuate it. Ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. I'm not um, recognize you, and Mr. Vignani would be more careful. I will, I, Go ahead. I apologize. Um, last, at, at the special town meeting when we discussed this item, it was for additional funding. We were looking for extra money to be spent and added to the budget so that we could start this position six months earlier than we want to right now. In order to fund this position right now, it's incorporated in the normal budget process as every other personnel person in the town is, and it's just another component of the budget. So there's a big difference between what we went for in the special town meeting and what's we're in now. Um, I, I explained earlier, this is probably the most critical position that we're gonna have moving forward if we expect a su success on the projects that we just passed. Um, and I think that, that was my sense and why this is important. And um, the town administrator has many roles in this town. She's the chief financial officer, but she doesn't cut the checks. She's the pre chief procurement officer, but she doesn't um, fill out every PO. You know, she is in charge of inventory all the assets in the town, but she's not the one that maintains them all. So that's, um, that's you know, in response to that part of the question. Was there something else I missed? No, that's fine. Um, you're ready to go, so ma'am. Good evening. I'm Susan Dayliter, the new, newest member to the advisory committee. And I was actually the dissenting vote on the overall article, but not for that specific item that you're discussing. 
Uh, my concerns, although I have to say as a first year member, I've been uh, overwhelmed and extremely impressed by all the work and the knowledge and expertise by our town officials. Um, that being said, I did have some general concerns about the municipal planning process and while great strides have been taken, I do believe that there are that we could be doing more to affect the types of economic changes that we need to make our town and community uh, more prosperous. And frankly, I think the facilities manager is a, a position that we need because things have sort of fallen awry. We've been a little bit complacent to some extent, and I think now we have an opportunity. We have a great team, I think, in place to, to move forward, and I think we have to move our town forward. Thank you. Mr. North. And this is all in response to uh, Ms. Strode's request for comment about people's feelings. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, it is true that last year, last fall, we did come forward with this, with this position. Facilities manager in town meeting and its wisdom voted it down. Uh, I don't think I've ever served on a board that, that uh, had more respect for town meeting than this board I'm on right now. We respect town meeting, we understand town meeting. Over the years, as I look back, although I did not agree with town meeting at some times, and town meeting didn't agree with me, and the great majority of the time, town meeting was correct. This is coming back tonight for a very, very good reason. Chairman Vignati stated, and he's absolutely correct, that this is one of the most important positions that we've ever attempted to put before town meeting. We just voted uh, potentially $9 million over the next years to improve school buildings and town buildings, which anyone who has any contact with those buildings know what condition they're in. We absolutely, positively, need someone to oversee these projects. It, it is probably, and I'll repeat what Mr. Vignani said, the most important uh, position that we'll fill uh, not only this year, but in years to come. This position was funded. The town administrator worked diligently in the past six months to find money to, to, to cut other positions uh, in town, not to fill positions in town, so she'd have enough money, as uh, she recognized, to have enough money to, to fill this very important position. Thinking back, I know that we've made some very important decisions in this town. Uh, but this, believe me, is, is one, of the, one of the big ones. I urge you to vote for this position. We need it desperately. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Thank you. I just jotted down a few notes while the question was being asked. I think someone mentioned it earlier. First of all, it's 55 buildings. That's an awful lot of buildings. Secondly, not that I care what's happening in other towns, but other towns are putting this, uh, filling this position, all right? But more importantly, since it was first talked about a year or so ago, I just really believe that if the right person is put in this position, they will more than pay for themselves. For example, when we do construction jobs on schools and municipal buildings, that they, in, in their change orders in place, this person could be in that position to prevent that from happening or if changes were made to make it make these buildings more efficient, like Joe just said, the savings alone will more than pay for themselves, pay for that person's salary. Mr. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, I voted in favor of this as well, and I think it's an extremely important position. Um, a couple things just to reassure people in the audience, and I thank Ms. Stroke for bringing up this point, but budgets were rearranged within the town side of things uh, to make uh, or to find the money for this position. It reminds me of how last year or maybe two years ago I stood before you and we asked for the position of the IT manager. And through the excellent financial leadership of the town administrator, we were able to take money from various other budgets where that purpose was redistributed and we brought it under one position, and now we have an excellent IT manager running all that show. And so this is very similar to that, in that money was taken from this department, that department, and so on, where it was all done piecemeal, 
And now with this important position hopefully being filled, it's going to um, make things much more centralized and that much more efficient. I would also like to hold up one graph, and I recognize you can't see this even in the front row, but hopefully you can see the curve. And if I will, if I may, on the left is fiscal year 09, and on the right is fiscal year 13, and everybody can see this line going down. And this is the number of FTE on the town hall side of things. And this decrease from FY09 to FY13, which includes the facilities manager, is a decrease in FTEs of 13. So town hall on the municipal side is not getting bloated. We are not adding increased personnel and just expanding continually. We are operating with fewer people than we have over the last five years. We have fewer people and we have more buildings and we have more projects. I urge you all please to support this critically important position. Thank you. Mr. Dan. Good evening, folks, and welcome. Thank you for coming to our town meeting. Um, Mr. Strode, I have to tell you, that's the first question that I've seen and offered or asked at town meeting where every selectman has gotten up to say something about it. So I commend you on your question. I think it's very good. You're um, welcome. I have to tell you, um, Mr. Harris just asked me, do you have anything more to add? The answer is yes. 55 buildings is what Mr. Harris had said. 55 buildings is what this town has. A furnace in each one, roof for each one, public, or the plumbing, toilets in all of them, an air conditioning unit in most of them, if need be, some of them don't, but a lot of them do have it. You have steps, access, both regular steps as well as disabilities to be able to have uh, uh, handicap, handicap uh, ramps. You've got driveways, you've got parking lots, playground equipment in some of the facilities like the, um, the schools as well as some of our parks. Recently I was at a school where one of the slides at the bottom, right at the bottom had been broken. Had any kid gone down it, which they were going, could have very easily sheared, if you will, their backside. It was taped, duct taped. A facilities manager person would be taking care of this situation. A phone call would go to go from there. You have windows that are broken, glass that's broken. Recently, I was at Lawson Tower. It needed to be replaced. One of the um, um, triangular glass, actually the dining glass in the front door needed to be replaced. Who's going to fix that? Insulation needs to be dealt with in some of these buildings. Um, believe it or not, toilet paper, paper towels, who's going to handle all this for these buildings? Town administrator? Is that what you'd like to have her spend her time doing? Carpet needs to be replaced. Rooms need to be painted. Lights. Speakers, just like this. You have snow plowing, cleaning off the walkways. You have damage from storms or from vandalism, graffiti. You have water fountains that are broken, like Town Hall, which was broken for a number of years and recently fixed. Chairs and other items. As I said to you, the town administrator has a lot of duties. So you might say, well, should she be going around having to fix 55 buildings, trying to fix it? Do you want the head of the DPW doing that? Who's going to take care of the engineering? Who's going to take care of the sewage? All the engineering with all the new um, priorities that we're doing up in the mining area. And um, Squash Capon, the water department. We have problems with our water pipes breaking. Do you want the, the uh, building department or the uh, DPW director to have to fix these buildings and delay the water breakage? Because that's what his job's supposed to be doing. You've got snow. You've got uh, roads and sidewalks for the DPW. Or do you want to turn around and say, well, we want the building enforcement to do it? I mean, logistically, I, I know I'm going on about this, but think about it. I have a house and I have an office. When something breaks down, it sidelines me from my job. And that's the reason why we need a facilities manager. A person who's going to be responsible for the 55 buildings that we have. A person who's not only going to be dealing with the old buildings or the buildings that we have presently, but going forward with anything that we're looking to do to kind of streamline and make things more efficient. That person, he or she can take a look and say, what are you talking about putting in that type of glass? We need this type. We need something that's going to be more green, something more efficient. So that's the reason why I voted for it. And that's the reason why I suggested and supported it last year. And I would do it again because you know what? 
I know myself, I don't have the time, I don't have the expertise. And the person that we need in this town for all these buildings is somebody who understands what is needed to maintain these buildings. We have a budget of over $58 million. Companies have a facilities person. You can go to a condo association with a number of buildings. They have a manager, a company that manages these buildings so that people don't have to worry about that. So given the times and given our viewpoint on the board, that's the reason why we're supportive of it. And so I ask you tonight to also support it. Thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Strode, you have one minute. Well, I still didn't have the question answered as to, <coughs> pardon me, the vote was no a year ago. We had 55 buildings a year ago. The article was presented by the town administrator. This year, we still have 55 buildings. Uh, and as I said, three months after our special town meeting, <coughs> pardon me, uh, DPW was at the advisory committee getting their support, which obviously they did. Um, the buildings didn't change, and I just wonder, again, going back to the taxpayers voted no last year, and I appreciate all of your dialogue on Selectman, thank you, but facts are facts. It was voted no, 55 buildings, and then it changed from the town administrator um, Ten seconds. Bring, bring, bringing this article <coughs> pardon, to the DPW. I would suggest vote no. No, it's last year from the taxpayers. It's the same this year. Um, more has been added. <coughs> pardon, um, it's our money it was 2.2 million override. Time, please. Vote no. Could be some uh, late to know. Elizabeth McAdams, 25 Park Ave. I would like to reiterate what the woman at the other mic said. This was brought up last year, and I feel that this time it was pushed in to a budget so that it would just automatically be passed. I think we should listen to all of her concerns. I think that there was an agenda, and I think that we were trying to be misled. Thank you. There being no one else at the mics, we're ready for the question. All those in favor of line 400 as presented in the budget signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Uh, so voted and declared a majority passed. And vote. Any seven people wish to challenge that determination, please rise and do so now. That's one. Two. Three. You're not rising, you're raising your hand. Four, five, okay, five, six. Oh, there's a whole bunch of them, I see. All right, with the tellers, please take your place. votes, you have a voting card. When I call for your vote, please hold your card up nice and high so that the tellers can see it. All those in favor of line item 400 public works as presented by Selectman Vin uh, Chairman Vignani's motion, please raise your voting card to be counted now. Well said. 
Okay, thank you. You may put your hands down. Uh, right rear bleacher, Chris. Right rear bleacher, 23. 38. All right. 38. Right front bleacher, Penny. Thank you. Right front bleacher, 24. Right rear floor, Ron. Okay. Right rear bleacher, uh, right rear floor, 23. Right center floor, Heather. 1717. 17, right center floor. Right front floor, including the advisory committee and the school committee, Frank. 20, 2, 0. Left rear bleacher, Peter. 19. 1, 9. One, nine. One, nine. Left front bleacher, that's George. Uh -oh. All right. Left front bleacher. It's Peter and it's Ken. Ken, one zero. Sorry. Left rear floor. Thirty-four. Three four. Three four. Thank you, George. Left center floor. Twenty-two. Two two. Two two. Left front floor includes the moderator. I don't vote. Clerk, selectman, and registrars. One seven, 17. One seven. Thank you, Rich. All right. All those opposed to the motion made under line item 400, please raise your voting cards now. Center floor. Eight. Eight. Right front floor, including advisory committee and school committee. Five. Left rear bleacher. Six. Six. Left front bleacher. Two. Two. Left rear floor. Five. Five. Left center floor. Thirteen. One. Three. Left front floor includes moderator, clerk, selectman, and registrars. Zero. Zero. By a vote of 224 in favor and 66 against, the motion carries. <laughs> Madam Administrator, is there any other business to be done under the budget article? We're all set? Okay. Uh, before we go to Article 6, on behalf of myself, and the meeting members, I'd like to present these roses to our town clerk, Bernice Brown, and thank her for the many years of service she's given.
Uh, I've, I've just been asked to remind people that uh, if you leave, you vote with your feet, but someone who's still here could always vote to reconsider. Uh, Article 6, Precision of Authorized but Unissued Debt, the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Dan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, I move the town rescind the balance of the loans authorized and unissued by prior annual and special town meeting authorizations pursuant to the following articles and approvals. Wastewater treatment plant upgrade, the amount is $15,117 from the annual town meeting of 1997, Article 4F. Uh, the remaining balance on use is $100. A fire station at 136 Manlot Road and Lot 14-1-58 Hadley Road, the amount of $2,825,000 from 2000 Annual Town Meeting Article 11, 2001 November Special Town Meeting Article 2. Again, the balance unissued is $2,825,000. Sewer extension, design, and construction. Amount was $13,544,000 from the 2002 Annual Town Meeting from Article 4K. Balance on use is $996,341. Renovation of schools at the amount of $3,000,000 from the 1998 November Special Town Meeting Article 8 and the 2000 February Special Town Meeting Article 1. Balance on used $773. The new senior center at 75 Branch Street, $1.9 million, 2004 Special Annual Town Meeting, Article 5, balance unissued, $1.9 million. Marine Park Design and Construction, the amount of $831,475, issued at the 2005 October, October Special Town Meeting, Article 14. Balance on issued is $799,945. And school vehicles, amount authorized $105,000 from the 2007 Annual Town Meeting, Article 4.3. Balance on issued is $18,000. Is there a second? Seconded, Mr. Harris. Discussion, Mr. Dan. Thank you again, Mr. Moderator. Uh, this article would rescind prior town meeting authorizations for projects that either were one, never came to fruition, or two, have unexpended balance after completion that we can close out. In the case of the school vehicle authorization, as we noted above, we are endeavoring to pay these funds uh, with cash going forward as opposed to trying to do it through authorization. Two items, the construction of the fire station and the senior center have town meeting authorizations that are specific to the site. And what I mean by that, to 75 Branch Street as well as to Haverly Road. Theoretically, town meeting could change this authorization and amend it to another locale, another uh, location. But at this point, the Board of Selectmen feel the better course is to rescind the outstanding amount. The Marine Park project is completed and no additional funds are needed. Uh, this is one of the projects that actually came in under budget, plus, more importantly, we were able to get grants. Consequently, we're looking to rescind that amount that's left over, that we haven't, while being authorized, we haven't used. As we move forward, we will request borrowing authorizations that are more generic, as opposed to being specific. What do I mean by that? In other words, instead of specifically saying we're going to put it at this site, at this location, we'll keep it more general so that those funds can be used at other sites in the event that those particular intentions, those projects don't get built, like the senior center, like the fire station. And finally, and I think this is probably the most key component, this authorization debt is seen by rating agencies, okay, as something that can be floated in a bond at any time. So when we get assessed and valued or rated, they look at what you can potentially spend and then they rate it and they give us a rating. This can hinder us going forward with new projects. And I always 
suggest that if you take it from a credit perspective, if you're given one credit card, no problem, you're given a credit limit. But if you have five or ten, and you try to get something else in credit, people are going to look at that and say, I'm sorry, you already have so much credit available to you, we can't give you because you're a risk. Cleaning up these moot authorizations will improve our overall debt picture and keep us moving in the right direction for good fiscal management. Thank you. From the Advisory Committee, Mr. DeLorenzo. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we believe that in the spirit of uh, cleaning up the books that this is very, very good uh, fiscal management and the Advisory Committee was unanimous in their support of this motion. Gentleman to my right. Pete Toppin, 26 Clap Road. I agree with cleaning up the articles, believe me, that's fine. But I've never understood and I'm asking a simple question, what happened to the firehouse on Manlock Road? Did we run into a legal problem or what? <coughs> Mr. Dan. It, it didn't pass the override. The override in 2007 when we were trying to authorize it, it didn't pass. It's that simple. Lady to my right. Ann Burbine, 10 Pentecost Road. And yes, I, with Mr. Taubman, understand that we need to clean up the articles. But my concern is we do need another fire station. And, you know, I, the override in 07, actually, there was a lawsuit as far as Havily Road was concerned. There was a lawsuit concerning the corner of 3A and Manlock Road. So those things sort of got pushed off, pushed off, pushed off. And the same thing can be said for the senior center. And we need, and again, you're cleaning up these articles, and that's fine. But we also need to know that this town truly supports its seniors and its fire department public safety. So somehow, some way, we need to know that we will go forward for a new senior center or some facility for our seniors and also for another fire station in your situate. I know it's part of the major plan, but if the major plan does not come to fruition, we need to change things, and we need to move forward. Thank you. Lady to my right. Ellen Bernardi, um, 616 Havilly Road. I wanted to speak as well to the Senior Center, and I'd like to just make a couple of comments and then um, uh, mention what I was liking to propose. The seniors um, in this town, I feel, have been more of a quiet, and I would say almost majority. This is the fastest growing population, not only in situate, but everywhere. Uh, across the country. At present, we have 4,344 seniors in situate, which make up about 24% of our population here. 70% of them have lived in their homes for a number of years, and they pay taxes, and have been paying taxes. The senior center that we all know now has, is in a building that is old, like the other 54 buildings that are in town. By viewing and going through the senior center, there is mold, mildew, inadequate heat, um, and certainly space. Recently, a wonderful um, uh, March 17th luncheon was, was done, 42 people attended, and 45 people were on the wait list. That's 45 people that sat in their homes because we couldn't fit them into the senior center. The Gerontology Society of America, the Association of Older Americans, and then the Beverly Foundation, which is three well-known um, communities all talk about aging in place. The best thing for our seniors is to age where they want to age. 
And we have so many two-income families where a member of the family is not home during the day with the senior that may be aging. By having a viable senior center, those problem of uh, having a place for seniors instead of being isolated would be addressed. And I think it's important that as I look around and I see a good proportion of the people here are in my age uh, bracket of being considered a senior, but also the 50 year olds and even some 40 year olds, as you look ahead, this is being proactive because this is going to take care of you as time goes on. And it will be a source of not only a building, which certainly we need buildings here, but it is going to improve the quality of life of so many of our population and our growing population. I, I would like to propose that the $1.9 million that is stated for 45 Branch Street be kept in the budget, in the town's money, with the option that we take out the address. I think that the voters of town meeting back in 2004. All right. Um uh, 30 seconds, and if that's a motion to amend the article, I will accept an amendment to delete the reference to the 1.9 uh, in the cleanup. I will not accept an amendment to change the address because that's beyond the scope of the article. Okay. We're not addressing the merits of whether there should or shouldn't be a senior center, but just simply whether this should be taken off the books or not. Okay, and so, I would say I would like to at least stay in the books so that the board of directors of the um, Council on Aging and volunteers can move forward to utilize this money to find a facility, maybe something that's already here, and move our seniors who have been waiting since 2004. Okay, time. Before. I'm sorry, time please. Okay. Uh, that's a motion to amend Article 6 as moved by deleting the reference to the new Senior Center, $1.9 million. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second. Discussion on the amendment to delete the $1.9 million. Council is questioning whether the amendment is within the scope of the article. Uh, I'm ruling that it is within the scope of the article, uh, and here's the reasoning. You have seven different items which the Board of Selectmen is seeking to take off of the books as authorized indebtedness. The effect of the motion would be to remove the senior center money from the list of things to be deleted from the previous authorizations. A uh, yes vote on uh, this motion does not build a senior center. It does not change the address of the senior center. All it does is leaves the $1.9 million on the books. A no vote on the amendment uh, would preserve the motion so that the $1.9 million would come off the books if the motion as originally made was approved. And for those reasons, I am ruling this within the scope of the article. Now, uh, discussion on uh, the motion. <laughs> Sir, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Folks, you can do that. That's up to you. But, let, you know, I think it was alluded to earlier by Chairman Vignani. The Board of Select and along with the Town Administrator, we're looking long term now. We have a strategic plan that we're looking at employ and beginning to um, uh, put into works. That's the reason why under Article uh, 4J we asked for the appropriation of about $375,000 to look forward. 
as a part of that, it's a part we're looking at senior center, or what I'd like to say is more of a community center. You, Ellen is absolutely right. The senior center is an abomination. It is awful. It's a building that was built in 1840 because it was a schoolhouse. Then it was modified into a fire station. And if anybody here has yet to go down to see the senior center, then you should. It's your town building. It's your senior center. It's awful. But we need to have a plan going forward for a better senior center or a community center. And the Board of Selectmen are looking at Gates as the panacea for that situation to be able to have a community where not only seniors can go, but more of a recreation, more of a town hall, something more lively, something that's gonna be accessible, parking, and this is a part of the grand plan. In addition to that, the Affordable Housing Trust in conjunction with the Situate Housing Authority and the Council on Aging are looking at an alternative on the driftway, the 12 acres. There'll be a meeting on Wednesday night to begin to discuss that in the event that our strategic plan fails. Either way you cut it, we need more than 1.9 million for a senior center. And if you've seen any other senior centers, and I have, Orleans, East Long uh, Meadow, I've been to Duxbury, I've seen other ones that are phenomenal facilities. It's a shame to have the one we have, but the 1.9 is not gonna do it. And all it's going to do is hinder our ability going forward for ratings for trying to accomplish what we're looking to do. So I would implore you to continue with what the Board of Selectmen along with the Town Administrator and the Advisory Committee unanimously has suggested to you all. But if you don't want to do that, that's fine. At some point, that's going to have to be erased because we're going to come back and we're going to say we're going to need money. And it's going to be a lot more than 1.9 and it will be earmarked for the um, uh, Senior Center. As to the fire, that too is a part of our strategic plan. It failed in 2007 because of the override, and the people in North Situate, as well as the people in the West End, deserve a fire station that's going to be closer. And our plan is to put something along 3A. And I think somebody suggested, suggested that we're going to lose the central fire, or it won't be yeah, centralized. Uh, just with respect, I think a discussion of the fire station situation is beyond the scope of the amendment. Fair enough. So again, I just ask you to support both your advisory as well as your board of selectmen. Thank you. Lady to my right. Thank you. I'd just like to, my name is Betty Johnson. I'm 40 Ellen Place. I'd like to reiterate what Ellen said. I don't want to see the money go away. I don't want to see it disappear. I'm, I don't think that the voters in 2004 wanted that only if it could be at Branch Street. I think people, in, the seniors in situate, deserve more than one room, two toilets, and no parking. Um, the seniors in situate are going to surrounding towns where there are adequate and beautiful senior centers, but what's gonna happen when those people shut their doors to out-of-towners? Recently, I was told about a program in Hingham that sounded really interesting, but said, oh no, you can't go there because they're closing that to people that aren't from Hingham. What's gonna happen when the other surrounding towns start closing their doors to situate people. And if I could just have people think for one minute before you leave tonight, what are we showing and teaching our young people by the way we're looking after our elders? That's all, thank you. Ma'am. Hi, my name is Renee Summers to Murphy's Lane. Uh, I agree very much with what Ellen has said. We have more seniors who are going to be turning 85 years old in this town, not only in every part of the world. And we do need a senior center. And I want to know what's going to happen if you take that money out. How are they going to get it back in? How are they going to get it and use it when they need it, when they make some decisions? I think it's not possible to take it out and not get it back. Thank you. I, I say Gentlemen of the Seven Mike. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Jamie Gilmore, 735 First Parish Road. Uh, I'm in support of the Senior Center, and um, from my uh, opinion of uh, listening to everybody here, I don't think there's anybody in this room that is not in support of 
to upgrading a senior center to something that's habitable, decent, functional, and hopefully will serve me when I finally get old. The, when? When, when I finally get old, thank you. The, um, careful. The, uh, the exercise that I see here is an exercise of good accounting practice and bookkeeping. I don't think to lose this $1.9 million item uh, is going to affect how we go forward to build a great senior center in the grand scheme and grand plan. We spent a lot of time earlier tonight, and I know I'm talking a little bit off the topic, but a lot of time earlier tonight setting a course for really doing something in a non-piecemeal way. I think the $1.9 million, although noble and laudable, and laudable was, a, was a piecemeal type of method. We have to stop the piecemeal concept. We have to support the master plan, the $375,000 that was already promoted to create that plan, and we have to do it in harmony with the future. I want to see a senior center, but to leave $1.9 million and affect our rating is just doesn't make sense right now because we're not going to build it tomorrow. Thank you. Briefly, Mr. Dan. Sure. You know, I, I want to make sure we're clear here. I think we're having a violent agreement in that the Board of Selectmen and the Town Administrator agree. You're preaching to the choir. We need a new senior center. The authorization in 2007 was for $3.5 million and it failed for the specific site at 75 Branch Street. The authorization, while it's 1.9, is not gonna get us a new senior center on what was proposed. And that's the reason why we're looking at a strategic plan going forward saying, when we come back, we're not gonna be looking for 1.9, we're gonna be looking for a lot larger number, but it's going to be the panacea for a multiple issues and ills that the town has had for a number of years. So I don't want to make sure we're clear here. The board isn't just saying let's erase it and walk away from it. The board is saying we need more money and at some point in the future, presumably next year or shortly thereafter, we're coming back and saying this is what we're proposing, part of which is going to be the senior center. So by all means, as I said to you earlier, you can vote it down, that's fine. However, we're trying to do this in a fiscal manner looking forward to make sure that when we do come back, we're going to be asking for specific amounts uh, for the strategic plan. Thank you. Lady to my right. Nancy Toppin, 26 Clap Road. I move the motion on the amendment. The mo is there a second? There is a motion to move the question. If that motion is approved by a two-thirds vote, debate on the amendment will be terminated and we will come to a vote on the amendment. All those in favor of terminating debate on the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Uh, so voted and declared unanimous. Debate, debate on the amendment is over. We now come to a vote. Uh, let me try to explain what it is that we're voting on uh, in case anyone is not clear. Article 6, as originally presented, has seven items that were voted at previous town meetings, seven borrowers. One of the items is a $1.9 million authorization voted at the September special town meeting under Article 5 for a new senior center at 75 Branch Street. The motion to amend the article, if passed, would delete that particular item from the list of items that will be expunged from the books. Is everyone clear on that? Okay. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. The amendment fails. Timothy, but it fails. We now return to discussion on the main motion which pertains to all of the items that were originally proposed. I see no one standing at the mics. This requires only a majority vote. All those in favor of Article 6 as originally presented signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? So voted and declared passed by a majority. Article 7. Mr. Danny. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, I move to town and establish a special reserve fund relative to acceptance of public waste pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 80, Section 1, 
and to transfer from available funds in the Treasury the sum of $200,000 and or authorize the Treasurer to borrow with the approval of the selectmen the sum of $158,000 for a total of $358,000 for the purpose of initially establishing the fund to pay for the costs of newly accepted public ways. Hold on, Mr. Mann. Mid-course correction. Go ahead and take it from the top. Let me uh, restate that again. Mr. Moderator, I move the town establish a special revenue fund relative to acceptance of public waste pursuant to the Mass General Laws, Chapter 80, Section 1, and to transfer from available funds in the Treasury the sum of $200,000 and authorize the Treasurer to borrow, with the approval of the selectmen, the sum of $158,000 for a total of $358,000 for the purpose of initially establishing the fund to pay for the costs of newly accepted public ways and conforming them to established road standards and further provided that such costs incurred by the town shall be reimbursed in full by the assessment of betterments to property order owners on the way for said work. Is there a second? Second of Mr. Norton. Discussion, Mr. Dan. Thank you again. This article would create a special uh, revenue fund that would fund the cost of improvements and repairs to accepted public ways. Seed money is required to establish this fund that will be paid ultimately by assessing betterments to the affected homeowners on those ways. Last year, we accepted several roadways with agreements from homeowners that they would pay the cost of the improvements through betterments to their streets. This amount totals to $358,000, and the town is obligated to make these repairs and assess the betterments. Once the betterment fund flow, uh, funds flow into the account, they will be self-supporting. The two roads were accepted at this year's, or the two roads were accepted at this year's annual town meeting. Do not require any improvements, and we'll, uh, we'll note that they do not contain any betterment language. In essence, folks, what we're doing is this: we're creating seed money for a fund to be able to build the roads up to the standards that the town has accepted those roadways. So in other words, the roads have already been built. They didn't meet the private roads. They didn't meet the requirements that the town set. Consequently, we went to all the people on those roads. We said, this is what you need to do in order to improve them. We're assessing a betterment to them. They're all going to pay it. However, where does the money come from? We could go out, we could bond it, we could borrow it. Instead, what we're doing is we're borrowing from ourselves, putting it into a fund, and then as the people begin to pay the betterments, we're going to be getting that money back. So we're basically trying to borrow from ourselves in order to build these roads without having to borrow money outside. Thank you. From the Advisory Committee, Mr. DeLorenzo. The Advisory Committee was unanimous in their approval of this motion. I see no one standing at the mics. Passage of this article requires a two-thirds vote on a kind of borrowing. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? So voted and declared unanimous. Thank you. Article 8. Mr. Danny. Yes. I'll state your point of order after giving your name, please. Sorry. Jen Morrison, 61 at High Lincoln Road. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to request that Article 4, Letter J, be reconsidered. Is there a second to reconsider Article 4, Letter J? It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. There is no discussion. All those in favor of reconsidering Article 4, Letter J, signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? No. Uh, the motion is defeated and the matter may not be reconsidered again. Uh, right. Well, let's carry on. I think, Mr. Danahy, you sure. were. Uh, Ms. Moderator, Mr. Article 8. Funding for other post-employment benefits library trust. I move the town raise and appropriate the sum of $68,884 for the purpose of funding the other post-employment benefits liability trust fund pursuant to Article 7 of the April 11, 2011 annual town meeting warrant as authorized by the general court in order to offset the anticipated future costs of providing post-retirement health and life insurance benefits to current and future retired town and school employees. 
Is there a second? Second, Mr. Murray. Discussion, Mr. Daly. Uh, this fund was created last year at the annual town meeting. This is a federally mandated requirement. We're obligated to do this, whether you like it or not. And it's directing towns like Situate to begin to start to fund the cost of health insurance benefits for its retirees. Our current unfunded liability, get this, current unfunded liability is 52, uh, $53,916,000, basically $54 million. If we had to pay it today, we'd have to come up with it. Last year, we appro appropriated $14,000 into this fund just to establish it. This year, we're looking to put in $68,000, almost sixty-nine. dollars the financial policy for determining this amount, the $69,000, it's $68,884, um, for determining the annual appropriation is basically 2% of the town's retirement assessment. It seems like a drop in the bucket, it definitely is. But it's something that we have to do. And so now we are looking at the 2% going forward is what we're going to be trying to allocate to this fund. Not much more I can tell you other than it's federally mandated. Whether you want to do it or not, you have to. So we're looking forward to trying to appropriate a sum amount, in this case 69,000. It seems like a small amount, but it's better than nothing. Uh, this was unanimously supported by the Board of Selectmen. From the Advisory Committee, Mr. Dole. And good evening. The Advisory Committee recommends approval of this motion. Requires a majority vote. There being no one at the microphones, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so vote and declare you in. So Article you. 9, Mr. Danny. Mr. Moderator, um, I move that the town transfer from available funds in the Waterways Enterprise receipts the sum of $928,574 and $89,050 from the Waterways Retained Earnings for the purpose of funding the Waterways Enterprise Fund for the ensuing fiscal year commencing on July 1st, 2012, as follows. Personal services, $359,718. Other expenses, $657,906. Second, Mr. Harris, discussion, Mr. Dan. Uh, this article, it's not some, um, no significant operational uh, changes from the uh, from last year's budget. Um, balance after town meeting and the retained earnings will be $411,031. The current retained earnings balance is $580,081. We're using $89,050 from that retained earnings to balance the budget. This obviously was unanimously supported by the Board of Selectmen. From the Advisory Committee, Ms. Daly. The Advisory Committee agrees with the selectmen and unanimously uh, approves this motion. This requires a majority vote. There being no one standing at the mic, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so vote and declare unanimous. Article 10, Mr. Daniel. This is the uh, Golf Course Enterprise Fund. Mr. Moderator, I move the town transfer from available funds in the Golf Course Enterprise Fund receipts the sum of $1,221,534 for the purpose of funding the Whittles Walk Golf Course for the ensuing fiscal year commencing on July 1st, 2012, as follows. Personal services, $174,253. The other expenses, $1,047,281. Is there a second? Seconded Chairman Vignani. Discussion, Mr. Dan. Uh, this year's golf budget um, is based on an increase that the Board of Selectmen decided in order to balance the budget. It was voted this past January. Uh, while the Board has been trying to keep the cost down for play, whether it's for your annual dues, dues or whether it's for just a, a round of golf, we determined it would be best to increase the price because we've kept it low during these economic times, challenging times. Even with these increases, our projected revenue is going to be really close. Uh, right now we have $7,043 in the retained earnings. 
by increasing the fees, we are projecting that we're going to maintain that amount. But given the fiscal situation, the fact that many people are trimming, the cutting back, not playing golf as much, um, the golf course is, is running very close. But we believe it will be actually turning a profit. And so therefore, we're asking for the support of this honor. From the advisory committee, Mr. Dole. There has been a, uh, a reduction in the expenses at the golf course, which will help provide that surplus. The advisory committee recommends approval of the motion. There being no one at the vote at the uh, mics, uh, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 11, Mr. North. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 11, the Wastewater Enterprise Fund. Move that the town transfer from available funds and waterways at the price fund receipts the sum of $1,921,680 and $462,000 to $1,692,699 from wastewater retained earnings and $646,994 uh, from taxation for the purpose of funding the wastewater treatment operation and expenses for the ensuing fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2012 as follows. Personal services, $459,077, and other expenses, $2,572,296. So second, second, Mr. Harris. Discussion, Mr. Norton. Again, there was no significant changes uh, from past years. Uh, enterprise funds, as we know, uh, are only paid for by people who take advantage of those particular enterprises, as such is the case with the waterways. Freight water, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, from the advisory committee, Mr. Antonelli. Um, yes, the advisory board has uh, reviewed this article and uh, we unanim unanimously approved it. The, the wastewater treatment plant is, uh, is operated under the direct supervision Bob Rowland, the division supervisor, and on the overall direction of Mr. Bangett, the DPW director. Uh, this, this treatment plan is a, is a pride and joy of the town. It, it, it operates within all of the state and federal permits, and uh, it's, a, it's a fine, a fine uh, piece of technical um, operation. Uh, what they're doing right now, Mr. Bangett is doing right now, is continuing with the inf infiltration info program. What that does is eliminate groundwater that gets into the system. And the groundwater that gets into the system, what that takes up capacity in the treatment plant. And so that, that capacity is taken up by the groundwater, it reduces the capacity of the plant, therefore it reduces the number of people who connect to the plant. So it's a very, very important, a very important project. He's also um, implementing the, um, <clears throat> a part of the, uh, the overall expansion program for the sewer of the town. Mr. Bangett right now is doing the sewering in the Shkoshka Pond area, and that there's real problems with pollution in that area. So if, when that project's done, it'll eliminate a lot of the pollution. So uh, we unanimously uh, recommend approval of this project. Uh, discussion. There being no one at the mic's approval, this would require a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 12, Transfer Station Enterprise Fund. On the motion, Mr. North. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $100,000 and transfer from Transfer Station Enterprise receives the sum of $1,050,752 for the purpose of funding the landfill and transfer station operation and expenses for the ensuing fiscal year, commencing July 1st, 2012, as follows. Personal services, $208,033, and other expenses, $942,719. Uh, $942, Seconded by Mr. Harris. Discussion, Mr. North. Again, there are no significant changes in fiscal year 12.
Appellant returned earnings and balances of $279,420, but none of these funds will be used to uh, balance the fiscal 13 budget. From the advisory committee, Ms. Conn. Oh. Mr. DeLorenzo, pardon me. My apologies to Ms. Conn. No, it's my turn to apologize because I made a mistake. For those of you looking in your book, uh, you'll notice that if you back away the total expenses from the total revenues, you wouldn't come up with a positive $3,300. You'd come up with a negative $6,700. However, the good news is the rest of the calculations are correct. So if you look at the uh, last year deficit of $51,941, and you look at this year's at $6,700, the net gain is a $45,241. So the numbers do balance in spite of my error. I apologize. Uh, I don't want that to overshadow the good work that the transfer station uh, management has done in, in uh, forecasting very realistic revenues, in managing their costs, and in negotiating with our outside suppliers for better rates. Uh, the result of that is, is not only have we picked up an efficiency, uh, but pending your approval of this article, the retained earnings in the transfer station will be $279,000, $279,420. Uh, the advisory committee recommends approval of this motion. Thank you, Mr. Uh, there being no one at the mics, approval of this motion would require a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 13, Water Enterprise Fund on the motion, Mr. Norton. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move to the town transfer from available funds of the water enterprise receipts the sum of $2,448,049, and for water retained earnings, the sum of $33,484 for the purpose of funding water division operation and expenses for the ensuing fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2012, as follows. Personal services, $718,883, and expenses, $1,762,000. $648. Sir, seconded. Seconded, Mr. Harris. Discussion, Mr. North. Again, Mr. Moderator, there are no significant changes from uh, fiscal year 12. Covered return earnings uh, balance is $695,488, uh, with $33,484 of that to be applied to the fiscal 13 budget. From the advisory committee, Ms. Conley. The advisory committee voted unanimously in support of this article, and we uh, recommend that you approve the motion. There's no one standing at the mic's approval of this motion requires majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 14, Stabilization Fund, on the motion, Mr. North. I move that, what is, move that the town raise an appropriate the difference between the levy net and the levy limit to the stabilization fund in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 3, uh, 5B. So moved and seconded. Discussion, Mr. North. This is an annual article that was put before uh, town meeting to fund the stabilization fund. From the advisory committee, Ms. Conn. The advisory committee voted unanimously in support of this article, and we recommend that you approve the motion. No one standing at the mic's approval of this motion requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 15, you, on Mr. motion, Mr. North. Mr. Moderator, move that the town assume liability <clears throat> in the manner provided by Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 91, Section 29, as amended. Uh, for all damages that may be incurred by work to be performed by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection for the improvement, development, maintenance, and protection of tidal and non-tidal rivers and streams, great ponds, harbors, tidewaters, foreshores, and shores along the public beach in accordance with Section 11 of said Chapter 91, and to authorize the selectmen to execute and deliver a bond on indemnity, therefore, to the public. Seconded by Selectman Murray. Discussion, Mr. North. Mr. Moderator, this allows uh, maintenance work to be done in all these areas. It's an annual 
article that we put before town meeting. From the advisory committee, Ms. Conn. The advisory committee voted unanimous, unanimously in support of this article, and we recommend that you approve the motion. There being no one at the mic's approval, this motion requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Thank you. All right. Article 16. Here's what we're going to do on this one, because this is a longer article. Uh, we're going to allow uh, Selectman Murray to make the motion. We'll take a second. Board of Selectmen, uh, through Selectman Murray, will offer the comments they wish to, uh, wish to make. And then uh, John Bowman of the CPC will give an overview of the community preservation article. Uh, then we'll get the recommendation of the advisory committee from Mr. Judge. I will then move through the article and ask for holds on each of the 17 items listed. So with that background, uh, select them all. Yeah, just read them all. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I would just like to say, uh, on behalf of the Board of Selectmen and, and essentially the entire town, uh, our thanks to the to the CPC Committee, Community Preservation Committee, and Mr. Bowman, the chair in particular, for doing such a terrific job, and he will mention uh, the members of this committee later, but uh, John, you've done a great job as usual. Uh, this is a, a huge article and a lot of time, we all know, and so I just would like to uh, thank John right up, right up there. If you might want to uh, turn to page 42 in your advisory committee report, you can follow along there. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town here and act on the recommendations of the Community Preservation Committee on the fiscal year 2013 Community Preservation Budget and pursuant to the Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 44B as printed in the warrant, item $125,000 from the Community Preservation FY 2013 estimated revenues to be reserved for the creation and support of community housing consistent with the act. Item $225,000 from Community Preservation FY 2013 estimated revenues to be reserved for acquisition and preservation of historic resources consistent with the Act. Item $325,000 from Community Preservation FY 2013 estimated revenues to be reserved for acquisition and preservation of open space consistent with the Act. $62,500 from Community Preservation FY 2013 estimated revenues for administrative expense of the Community Preservation Committee. Item five, $550,000 for acquisition of open space, the higgins McAllister property, up to $17,000 per acre. Item six, $167,500 for acquisition of open space, the Nicholas Wade Preserve Litchfield property, up to $5,000 per acre. Item seven, $30,000 for acquisition of open space, the Lind property, up to $5,000 per acre. Item eight, $20,000 for acquisition of open space, the Siminski property, up to $5,000 per acre. Item nine, $5,500 for acquisition of open space, the Bonomi property, up to $2,000 per acre. Item 10, $3,000 for historic resources, the Ellis House facade preservation. Item 11, $14,680 for historic resources, the restoration of the William Cushing Down plaque. Item 12, $6,670 for historic resources, restoration of the lighthouse and ledgers. Item 13, $20,000 for historic resources, Old Oak and Bucket House restoration. Item 14, $25,000 for land for recreational use, the situ Situate Historic Bike Trail. Item 15, $1,500 for land for recreational use, the Teak Sherman Community Garden. Item 16, $104,000 for land for recreational use, the softball field. Item 17, $50,000 for land for recreational use, Bates Lane and Hollycrest parking areas. 
Seconded by Mr. Harris. Discussion, Mr. Martin. Um, I'll let Mr. Bowman uh, speak on behalf of the committee and provide details. However, I would like to report that the selectmen uh, voted unanimously in favor uh, for zero in all of these except for item five, the Higgins McAllister property in which the vote was tied two to two. And item 11 was unanimous, 3-0 in favor. Item 12 was unanimous, 3-0 in favor. And item 16 was 3-1 to one in favor. All others were unanimous, 4-0 at the time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Yeah, we'll look. Uh, Mr. Judge from the Advisory Committee. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The advisory committee recommends unanimous approval of this motion with the following exceptions. Items 8 and 9, which is Siminski, Bonami, respectively, had unanimous disapproval vote of 8 to 0. Disapproval of these items was due to the advisory committee not receiving the benefit of these properties to the town of Situ. Items 6 and 7, Litchfield and Lindfield properties, respectively, unanimous 6 to 0 in support of the motion. And item 5, which is Higgins with Callister, received a majority 5 to 1 vote in support of the motion. The dissenting opinion focused on the issue of the town promulgating regulations and or conservation restrictions on discharge of firearms and hunting on town-owned properties in the West End, which has accumulated up to over 300 acres with community preservation funds. The town should not buy more land in the West End. Thank you. All right, from the CPC Chairman Board. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, and I'll be brief. I know it's been a long evening already. Um, I'd like to thank the town just for its commitment to CPC. I mean, to date, we've received over $5.7 million in matching funds. We've raised a total of over $12 million, and we've done $9 million in projects. We've received a basically 76% return on the money we put into CPC. We still have a significant $3 million fund balance um, that's available to do what I, I think are some upcoming important projects we're going to look at. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the committee, and our committee is made up of five members of other boards in town who not only do CPC, but they, they serve in roles on other boards, so, so they're out a lot of nights doing this. And, you know, tonight we have with us Frank Snow, who's on CPC and is also in the Conservation Commission, um, Bill Lindbacher, who's on the Planning Board, Mr. Gates from the Historical Commission, we have Michael Collins from the Housing Authority, and Richard Lane from Recreation. Um, there are also four at-large members, of which I'm one. Um, we have Mr. Scott, who's not here this evening yet. I, I think he's working. Um, we have Lisa Fenton, who is the vice chair of the committee and um, provides me with a tremendous amount of help in what we do. And we have George Kraft, and who's also an at-large member. So I'd like to thank the members of the committee for <laughs> This year we had over $2.1 million in applications. The, the, the articles you see before you ignoring the, the first four, which are just fund transfers, are about $997,000, you know, 75% of which is land acquisition, which is really what we were created to do. Um, we're looking for some more flexibility, and hopefully with the help of Representative Cantwell and some legislation we're gonna be able to help with you know, spending money on improving town fields, things we can't do now um, legally, but hopefully there's some legislation pending that will let us do some things the town sorely needs with that other $3 million. Um, and, and part of that might be helping in this master plan we're all talking about. Um, finally, just as to the articles to this year, I mean, we've, we've got some great land acquisition articles. I, I know there was, you know, respectfully, not everybody agrees with what we do, and, that, and that's why we have this meeting. Um, you know, the, the items, I believe it was eight and nine that the advisory board doesn't recommend. They're very small pieces of land. They, they are, you know, some of them are primarily wet, but they're very sensitive. They're in sensitive areas, and the, the Conservation Commission thinks they're very important to protecting, you know, um, in, in one point, the Bonomi property, there's a red maple swamp that that abuts that, you know, owning this piece helps us protect that better, and the um, Siminski property is at the head of Bound Brook, where, you know, we're talking about, you know, fixing the Herring Run. I mean, they're trying to recreate the Herring and do something with the dam there, so we think that Bound Brook piece is important, and, 
you know, we've offered a relatively small amount of money compared to what we usually pay for these pieces because they are primarily wet and not all of them. Um, with that, I, you know, I, I thank you and I thank you for all your support. All right, here's what we're going to do now. If, uh, again, if you turn over to pages 42 and 43 of your advisory committee book, I will call off the number of each item. If you wish to have discussion on an item, please say in a loud and clear voice, hold. At the conclusion of calling for holds, those items which have not been held will be subject to a vote without discussion and after which we will return to those that are held for more discussion. Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Number five is held. Number six. Number seven. Number eight. Number eight is held. Number nine. Number nine is held. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. Sixteen is held. Seventeen. The items that were held are 5, 8, 9, 16, and 17. We will vote on the remaining items, two of which, numbers 6 and 7, require a two-thirds vote, which means that I will ask for a two-thirds vote to pass the group as a bundle. All those in favor of the non-held item signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? So voted and declared a unanimous vote. Would the person who held item 5 proceed to the mic? And anyone else who wishes to discuss that, head for the mics. Item, item 5. Uh, I'm the one who held it. Okay, uh, gentleman yep. at my left. Steve Harvey, 411 Highway Road. Uh, I've got a couple questions. Uh, why were the selectmen tied? Um, what are we doing about the hunting regulations that I guess they voted? advisory board brought up, brought up, and perhaps most importantly, why is this costing us $17,000 an acre, and we've only appropriated $5,000 an acre for the other land? It seems like there's something, uh, doesn't seem quite square to me, so if that can be explained. To answer the question, Chairman Bowman. And, and I'm going to respond to the value per acre, I, I can't really respond to the selectmen. Um, th this is 30 and a half acres of primarily upland. Um, the pieces that you see for $5,000 and $2,000 an acre are primarily wetlands. This is, this is developable land. And, and again, our vote is premised upon we pay $17,000 an acre or fair market value, whichever is less. If it turned out to be more wetland than we thought it was and it, it was a lesser value, we would only pay that lesser amount. But, you know, for uplands, $17,000 an acre for developable uplands is an incredibly low price. Um, I, I believe there are a lot of developers that would love to get their hands on this property and, and build on it, and, and I think it will be gone if we don't act on it. Uh, I think it will get developed and, and there's access to it. So the 17,000 acre is what the CPC has paid as a cap that we've tried to hold on developable uplands. Are you generalizing on the question? Okay, well, whoever wants to go first, go ahead. On the question. So we're going to have the uh, two selectmen who voted in one direction to, to speak as to their reasons. But, okay, but then that was part of the question. Go ahead. Mr. Dan. To the gentleman up there in the top, yes. Um, both uh, selectmen uh, Harris and myself voted against this. My reason for it was that it abuts the uh, Gun and Rod, Rod Club. That's in the middle of litigation. We're waiting for a decision on it. The land where the firing range is directly goes across this parcel. And my feeling and position is let's wait a year, let's see what happens. Uh, if they're going to be putting conditions in so that they're going to be in, indoors, then it makes sense to buy the land. 
my fear was that we'd have projectiles going across that parcel. So I thought we should wait a year before we decide to spend half a million dollars on it. Selectman Harris, can ask some question? I had asked a question a year or two ago. It had to do with the $17,000 an acre. I really, that's just the way I feel. On some of these other articles, they weren't paying the people $17,000 an acre. That's, they feel it was worth less. You know, I've said it before. I said, you know, could we offer a little bit less money? It really has to do with the price of, you know, over half a million dollars. I just thought we should say that. Lady to my left. I'm Karen Connolly, 30 Roundtree Lane. I was a dissenting vote on this purchase. Um, when, and I have great respect for the Community Preservation Committee and for all the hard work that they do. And they have to do a lot of work to get things approved and they have to come before various boards and do a lot of work. So I certainly appreciate it. Um, I will say, however, that when we um, had the hearing at the advisory committee, the issue of the Rodney Gun Club did come up. And at that point, I was told, well, it doesn't really matter because hunting and shooting is allowed on town or property in the West End. And in fact, if you look at the town bylaws, in fact, hunting and shooting, and I'm making a distinction there between hunting and shooting. Shooting means you can literally go out into those woods, put a Coke can in a tree, and shoot at it. Hunting is regulated. And we as a town, I think, have the right, we should be consulted as to what we should do with this land. Currently, we have 300 acres, which is bigger than World's End. We spent $3.9 million on acquiring this land. Now it's up to us to manage it. I was out there the other day. There are signs posted now uh, showing where the Rod and Gun Club border is. But in all the other signage, there is no mention of hunting or shooting anywhere. It's not on the town website. It's nowhere to be found. The woman in Norton who was accidentally shot by a trained hunter was in her own backyard. I don't know how we can tell the town we're buying this land for recreational purposes, including hiking. There's never any mention in any of these applications that hunting is allowed and shooting is allowed on this land. I think it's up to the selectmen to take the lead on this and to start to put some regulations in place that say what we as a town want on this land. And until we do, I just don't see the point. And this, this property has actually been on the market numerous times in the past 10 years and has not sold. At this point, I don't even think it's going to be able to be sold to anyone else because of the pending litigation and because of the fact that currently, hunting and shooting is allowed west of 3A. Those of you who live on east of 3A can rest assured you're not, there's no hunting and shooting allowed there, with the exception of the glades and the marshes around the North River. So, I think until we as a town do a better job of managing the property that we've now put together, I think we should just put this on hold. Thank you. Gentlemen to my left. Uh, John Hip, 48 Booth Hill Road. Um, it seems like there have been a number of uh, points made um, in opposition. I think first, as, as far as the uh, price of the land goes, um, 17,000 acres, as you said, will be what's paid um, or, or what's established by appraisal. So we all know land is expensive and situate. Building lots go for upwards of $300,000. Um, 17,000 acres is strike me as unreasonable and it will be determined by an appraisal. Um, this is an important piece of land. It's the last piece in the puzzle um, that a lot of folks have put a lot of effort into assembling. Why is it in the West End? That's where the land is, you know? <laughs> That's where the open space is. So these are buildable areas that will be lost if we don't um, act on them. The town has always supported these types of purchases. As far as the other issues around hunting and safety, um, I think those are, those are really distinct issues. Um, that has nothing to do with the purchase of this land. There's land abutting it that has been conservation land, that has been open to hiking. There are no issues that, that I'm aware of in terms of anyone being endangered on any of these lands. Um, if the town wants to take up those uh, concerns separately, that certainly um, is, is possible um, and should be done, but um, we need to move on purchases like this when they come available. And we're fortunate to be in a market right now where 
there isn't as much pressure for real estate development, but we all know that will change. Uh, it's a desirable place to live, and if we don't protect these areas, uh, there's really no way to get them back. If you want to see what that looks like, uh, take a drive down Manlot Road and take a look at Whitcomb Pines, uh, which was an area behind our town forest, if you want to call it that, um, that was irrevocably lost to development. And uh, that's certainly not a great example. And we should move to prevent that in the future. Thank you. Gentlemen, hello. Uh, Frank Snow, Chairman of the Citrus Conservation Commission. Um, just a few pieces. Again, the price for 30 acres for a half a million dollars or whatever this appraises out to be. CPC will not pay more than the appraised value. Um, it is a bargain. It's, it's an absolute bargain, and it doesn't take much to see that. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of work in the last 10 years to acquire this massive land, almost 400 acres now, uh, in the West End that numerous people are using for all sorts of recreation, uh, certainly hiking, um, bird watching, whatever. There's a number of, of pieces of recreation. Um, to single out hunting, I, I think, is a mistake to not buy this piece of property. To say because it might be used for hunting and so we shouldn't buy it um, would be a serious folly. E each one of these pieces of property that we acquire have a conservation restriction placed on them. And that conservation restriction um, spells out what can and can't be done on that property. And it's not done in a box or, or in, in some void. It's done with uh, public input. Uh, lots of people are able to speak to those issues. Um, and we take all of that information and then decide how best to use that. One of the things that's been mentioned um, by CPC's chairman is to possibly create a group that we could um, get input, have some meetings on all the folks that use the property, that abut the property, that have some interest in the property, to come together and say, what's important to you? How, do, how best do we use this piece of property? What would be a safe way to use it? Um, from a lot of standpoints. I, I really don't think it's a good place to get into a debate about whether we use it for hunting or mountain biking or altering vehicles this evening. There's all kinds of uses that we could consider for this property. But the time and place for that is when we establish our, our um, conservation restrictions and discuss that and do it in, a, in, in an educated format um, with all of the facts. The fact that we're here for tonight is that we have a piece of property available to us at a reasonable price that will complete um, a purchase of a fairly large piece of property that we may not see that um, come about again. And I think that that's what we should stick to this evening when we make this decision. Thank you. Mr. Bolton. Um, just briefly, and, and Frank covered the, the price aspect. I don't think we need to beat that to death. I, I think it's a bargain. I think it's worth a lot more to a developer. And I, I think if a developer had this PNS, he'd act on it quickly. Um, as far as the Rod and Gun Club litigation, I, I believe there are both sides of that litigation here tonight. I mean, it's, it's a civil court suit that's in, I believe, Plymouth Superior Court. There, there's a Superior Court judge who's heard experts on both sides. He's going to decide whether it's safe for the Rod and Gun Club to operate there or not. And, and respect, and, to Mr. Dennehy and everybody else, but that judge is in a far better position to decide whether the Rod and Gun Club is safe to operate there or not. It, 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 it's not for us to decide, and, and quite honestly, I, I, I really don't know of anybody that's been hurt out there. I don't look forward to anybody being hurt out there. We posted the property because one of the, one of the parties to that litigation suggested that someone might wander onto the Rod and Gun Club property. We already own 300 acres, a lot of which borders other parts of the Rod and Gun Club. I don't know of anyone wandering on, but in, in, you know, being cautious, we decided to post it and say, if you go any further this way, you're, you're entering the Rod and Gun Club. Um, I, I don't know that I thought that was totally necessary, but, but we want to go that extra mile to try and protect our citizens. As far as regulations on hunting, um, 
And, and Karen and I, I respect the advisory board a great deal. We, that's part of the dynamic. We, we disagree sometimes. We have regulations on hunting. Currently, those regulations say you can hunt on the west side of 3A. There are people in this room who have, who have power to change those regulations anytime they want. And as a matter of fact, we are required to put a conservation restriction on that property. I don't decide what's in it. The, the Selectman Town Council and the Conservation Commission finally approved that conservation restriction and it's recorded at the Registry of Deeds. That conservation restriction can say no hunting, it can say no hiking, it can say nobody can go on the property at all. It's just for deer and raccoons and rabbits and, and, and I still think it's something we should acquire. You know, we need to protect habitat, we need to protect wildlife, we need to protect open space and that's what we do. And it isn't always for hiking or hunting or for people to use it. Maybe it just sits there. But, but it, you know, the, the presumption that this property will be there when we wait a year. Well, you know what? It took a lot of years to get the, the McCall Hayden McAllister piece under PNS. It wasn't always available to us at this price. And next year it may not. Maybe they'll decide they can get twice as much money for a developer. And why should they do it? You know, the town kind of said they didn't want it. So I, I suggest that. Waiting a year is, means the property may not be there. We don't have a PNS that lets us wait a year and buy it. Um, you, can, you can restrict this property. You can go to your Selectman and your Conservation Commission and say, we don't want hunting on this property. As a matter of fact, we don't want any trails on it because we think somebody might get shot. Um, I still think we should acquire it. I think we should protect it. I think, it's a, you know, I think the applicants and the people who are willing to sell us the property are, are doing a good thing for the town, believe it or not. So. I think you should vote in favor of this acquisition. If there being no one else at the mics, approval of this motion would require a two-thirds vote, acquisition of land. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Uh, so voted, and I declare it passed by a two-thirds vote. Any seven people wish to challenge my determination to stand now. Seeing no one standing, we now move to the next held item, which is number eight. And gentleman at the center mic. Hi, Mark Bissell, 28 Captain English Building. Um, held this one so I wanted to hear from the advisory board. I respect all the work that we've done on both teams. Thank you very much for all the hard work. Unanimous uh, disapproval. Could someone please enlighten us as to the, decision, the thought process behind that? Volunteers? Mr. Judge. The understanding we had after discussing the details of the property from the um, Community Preservation Commission was that the property was mostly wet, and as far as the retained value we see as far as the town, we didn't see the perceived value that the town would gain by having purchased the property. So we didn't see it as a gain for the town and We thought the might be useful to do a better purchase. Thank you. Gentleman to my left. Uh, Frank Snow, Conservation Commission. Um, this piece of property of us, the Brown Brook Estuary, um, we're in the process of, of looking at Hunter's Pond, the Boundbrook area, um, possible um, reintroducing drumless fish to that area. We feel that this acquiring this piece of property um, gives us some control, some access, and protects the buffer around that as well. And for this amount of money, uh, it's, it's good value. It's also right adjacent to. Um, North Situate, and with some short extension, there could be a little path into the Bound Brook. Um, it's just a, a decent piece of property to hang on to, and for $20,000, um, be ashamed to let it go. There being no one else at the mics, acquisition of land requires a two thirds vote. All those in favor of the motion for item number eight signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. So voted, declared a two-thirds vote. If any seven people challenge my determination, you may rise now. No one has risen, and we now move to item number eight. Oh, nine, pardon me, we just did it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Gentlemen of the center mic. 
Mark Bissell, 48 Cab, Dillon Trail Lane. Uh, same question on number nine. So you describe your uh, unanimous opposition from the advisory board, please. From the advisory committee, Mr. Judge. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the thought process for this piece of property was the same as the previous. Although affordable or cheap, we didn't see the retained value that the town would benefit by having purchased it. So we decided that the money could be used for better purchase in the future. I see Mr. Snow waiting to my left. Um, this piece of property is, is off of Hollis Street. It abuts um, or is part of a red maple swamp. Um, for anybody that used to walk the railroad bed before the train came in, you could walk from Hollis Street down to the highway barn, and especially in the fall, this was a, a beautiful piece of um, property in the town of Situate. Um, the access to that is pretty limited now with the train. Um, this will allow a little bit of access to that red maple swamp. Uh, again, it's protecting a piece of property uh, that we feel is, is important um, to the town. And uh, 2,000 an acre, I think we're getting good value. There's no one else with the mics. Appropriation of money for the purchase of land requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? So vote and declare a two-thirds vote. Any seven people wish to challenge my determination may rise now. No one has arisen. Now we move to item number 16. Lady to my left. Mariana Schlaps, 50 Main Road. Uh, I have a question about this. Uh, location is uh, discussed as being between the town hall and the high school. We had a speaker a little earlier. Uh, from the Conservation Commission saying that there was a vernal pool in this area, and I'm just questioning uh, why we would want to put a softball field in that area. It just seems like a bad idea. I recognize uh, Mr. Snow of the Conservation Commission. The issue of the vernal pool is, is the uh, pond between the town hall and the high school, and we did um, acknowledge that is a vernal pool when the softball field was originally proposed. Was closer to that, working with the uh, rec department and and uh, DPW and others. It's been moved away from that um, from a pool. We feel that that's a safe area to go. Chairman Bowman. Uh, and, and just so we're clear, too, what we've been able to do is originally there was a project that was a playground that was going directly behind the town hall. Um, the people from the rec department got together so that the softball field and the playground are going to be in the same location. And it's going to be very much to the, sort of to the left of where that vernal pool is. So if you're behind Town Hall between the high school, it's going to be up towards that hill where there's, there's a road that I don't remember when we were kids that used to be able to go up, but you can't. But it, it's, it's going to be up into that hill. It's not going to affect the vernal pool. And it's actually going to have a much better traffic flow because it's going to give you a two-way road so that you can have a second way in and out of the high school. And the only proviso that's on it right now is it is going to await the master plan before they start construction so that we make sure we're not putting a softball field that then when they go to build a middle school, we're going to tear up the softball field. So we've agreed with the rec department and the selectmen that it won't go forward until sort of the master plan establishes that it is out of the, the path of any potential middle school that might go on that site. Lady to my left. Lisa Thompson, 40 Labs Way. Um, I concur with Barry Allen's question as well, and that was going to be one of mine. And just because I do apologize that I haven't been to the meetings where you've discussed this. But just to clarify your point about it going where the walkway is up into the Seawood Road area, is that what you're saying? Does that mean you're going to cut that hill out? To answer the question, Chairman. So basically, the, the home from it by the required distance, and then we like relocate the bus road that's going to now be a two lane road to go around it. And, and we think it's a much safer traffic situation. I, I believe REC has met with traffic rules and regs, and everybody's looked at the plan and thinks it's a, a good access plan. So I, I don't think it cuts that whole hill out. I don't think that's a it's, it's not a huge cut. I think it fits in there without doing that. So wouldn't it be better, considering the master plan that we're, we've been discussing about the junior high moving where the town hall is and everything, wouldn't it be better to postpone this until, I mean, it's not as if it's a land purchase or under pressure. Wouldn't it be better to postpone it until we have a clearer picture of what we're doing, especially where this vernal pool is involved? Select so me, Mark. 
Yeah, Lisa, we did discuss that at length, and um, our sense, the Board of Selectmen's sense, is that this is a very urgent situation. This, this uh, field has been brought up many, many times in the past. And as Mr. Vignani said earlier this evening when talking about the grand plan, this grand plan is not going to lurk around for two, three, four, five years. We're going to do this study, which you folks in your, in your good wisdom supported, and we're going to find out if we're going to be able to move forward with that or not. And we're going to know within a year. The reason why we want to put this forward, and Mr. Bullman just said, um, you know, no one's going to be moving on this until we find out the status of the grand plan. But if the grand plan rapidly comes out to be not working, we wanted to have this allocation reserved so we could move forward with this field and start serving the people that want to use that field as rapidly as possible without having to um, you know, do any more unnecessary delay. There's been a lot of momentum working on this field at this location. The environmental concerns about the vernal pool have been completely uh, answered uh, successfully and safely. Um, so we want to be able to move forward on this if the grant plan doesn't work. But no one's doing a thing until the grant plan gets figured out. So your point is absolutely taken, and we have, uh, in fact, considered that, that point. So thank you for bringing it up. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, come on up. Thank you. Uh, Eric Richmond, Free Apple Tree Lane. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this. Uh, this is something the Recreation Commission and a lot of committees and other people in this town have worked very hard on. Um, where we put the softball field, it, again, we did address the environmental issues when we moved this away from the vernal pool. Um, in, in original, in originally moving it, the engineer suggested putting it uh, up into that hill where there were some significant cuts and there was also uh, some safety issues involved. Um, with the master plan in mind, uh, there was a playground project that was approved for behind town hall. Um, separated from the complex where the basketball courts are and the street hockey um, facilities are, tennis courts, football fields. Uh, so we took all this into account. We met with the school committees, public safety, and we came up with a plan. We we're very confident we'll work with any sort of master plan. It brings the softball field area, it brings the playground area, all into the area with those new basketball facilities, the street hockey. It's something that works really well together. Uh, we've added in a two-lane road, additional parking for these facilities, and on top of that, we've put sidewalks in, so there is good safe access, handicap access, not only along the roadway, but cuts along the edge of the vernal pool and connects the high school area to these facilities as well. So we put a lot of effort into it, and that, you know, as as the chairman said, we we did agree that we wouldn't move forward until we ensured that this works with that master plan. Uh, we never wanted to step on that master plan, but we feel very confident that what we come up with is going to work great with any master plan for that piece of property. Thank you. Just one more piece, even though... Mr. Snow. I'm sorry. For the second time. If any piece of this is within the buffer zone or around this front of pool, it will have hearings, public hearings, and that notice as any other project would. So it will be, folks with environmental concerns can be assured that we'll review this like any other project. Thank you. There being no one else at the mics, who will this item would require a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? So voted and declared a majority vote. Passed. Item 17. Gentleman to my right. Boss, from Slap Road. Is there any way we can reconsider uh, number five? Well, you can make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we reconsider number five. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Vignani. Discussion? There being none, all those in favor of reconsidering item number five, signify by saying aye. All those opposed? No. The motion to reconsider fails. It may not be resurrected. Item 17. Sorry, lady to my left. Good evening. My name is Noreen Gleason, and I reside at 188 Clap Road. Um, I brought this up. I, 
uh, for a few reasons. But first, I'd like to say thank you to the Conservation Committee for all of its efforts uh, in its acquisition of land and the ability to use it in many different forms. I myself take advantage of that almost on a daily basis off of Bates Lane. Um, my, my concern um, is this parking lot up Bates Lane. I'd also like to go on record and say thank you to Mr. Snow for his many years of uh, generosity in letting people park in his piece of land across the street, uh, which allows people to get up into that land and use it. My concern here on Bates Lane is that um, I, think, I, I think if you put a parking lot way back there, you, you run the risk of a public safety issue. Um, Bates Lane has been a contentious issue, I think, for many years prior to my arrival here in town. And I see that it's a, I'm not sure what we're calling it today, a statutory way, a private way, a public way. But to put it, a parking lot up there without any utilities uh, for lights, um, I think maybe will lend itself to other types of recreation that maybe we don't want to be going on up there. So those are my concerns. Mr. Snow also mentioned before that um, I think that there'll be a committee formed to maybe look at where that parking lot would go. But I would ask that a lot of consideration goes into putting a parking lot up that lane and all the different things that it invites prior to doing so. Thank you. Uh, did you want to... Mr. Bolton. Um, thank you. And, and again, so first of all, this, this is more than a parking lot in, just on Bates Lane. We're hoping to establish a parking lot and parking lot. These aren't going to be big paved parking areas. This is going to be you know, a, a gravel dirt parking area. Um, right now, to date, for, to access that 300 plus acres you're parking on Mr. Snow's property across the street, Mr. Snow, I believe, would like to use his property for something else than, you know, our parking area, um, understandably. We don't know the exact location on Bates Lane. I understand that there's a new home being built halfway down. We're thinking somewhere in the proximity of that, so there will be people and lights, and we're conscious of that. Um, we're also talking about establishing um, a parking area somewhere in Holly Crest for the Higgins McAllister access and it's up by Itchy's Corner where we've acquired the Hennessy parcel. They, there's also a piece we have that you know might be able to park you know five to ten cars um, off the street to access it from that point. So we're, we're talking about creating two or three parking areas to, to get into that 350-400 acres of conservation land and yeah exactly where it is on Bates Lane we do understand the concern. Mr. Snow is probably more well versed than I on where we would put it, but the idea is there, there is a house being constructed there. We're going to put it in an area where hopefully it's more visible and, and, and it won't be a place for you know, other activities as, as much as we can make it. Gentleman Tomano. Um, just one piece. I don't know if I said committee because I don't think I want to be on another committee. <laughs> But we will have a study group to look at how this parking and access trails and all those things are implemented. And, and I think it was Mr. Bowman's suggestion that we form a group, uh, informal or sub, to conservation, that we will look at all those things and address all the concerns that you've had, whether it's the access, um, misuse of the property, how do we control that will be looked at carefully before we make those uh, final decisions. Lady to my right. Ann Burbine, 10th and Chris Rowe. Um, I need to understand, I need a little more clarification on just how much of Bates Lane, which was adjudicated as a inaccessible private way a number of years ago. And my concern is, if we start improving this, to have a parking lot toward the end of it that is going to then connect with Holly Crest, we open ourselves up to further development further back in conjunction with the Hennessy property and Indian Wings. Mr. Bolton. And, and Anna, I apologize, maybe I confuse things, but we're not talking about connecting this to Holly Crest. We're talking about a parking area for maybe four or five cars off of Holly Crest and a parking area for some cars off Bates Lane and a, and a separate parking area over by the Henny CPs. And they're not connected. There's no roadway between them. I mean, you're going to have to get out of your car and walk over to Holly Crest and, and you know, maybe have another car over there. I don't well, know. But 
so it's not going to make a connection and you know I don't think we're talking about putting parking areas for 100 cars we're talking you know some little pocket parking areas that might be but know, how far up Bates Lane are you going to go I believe this is maybe a, a halfway up Bates Lane I believe there's a new house going on the other side of Bates Lane and this would be on the right side across across from that Frank if that's to answer the question, Mr. Snow. Um, the final location isn't clear. And, and again, we're going to be looking at how people use the property, where they'd like to enter the property, how they'd like to walk through, whether people want to be able to return. The trails are looping, whether they have an access point at one end or the other. Most people want to be able to leave their car somewhere and go over. Right now, to access a basis lane, folks have to park across the street walk over, up the clock road a little bit and in. We'd like to have them be able to have a safe place to park. Um, but again, we're going to look at all those issues. But this, we're not improving or developing this road. It's, um, it's already there, it's already traveled, and it's a matter of, of making a safe um, place and an accessible place for folks to use property that they've already purchased with their tax money and being able to access it and use it. Does the town own land on both sides of Bates Lane as it goes forward to the T at the end of it? To answer the question, anyway. Yes. Thank you. Gentlemen to my right. Steve York on 15 Captain Daniel Litchfield Lane. Uh, I just want to let town meeting know there's only two parcels of privately owned property that abut Bates Lane, and they're all the way up at the other end near Indian Wind. So likelihood of any development from Clack Road up Bates Lane, it's not going to happen in the private sector. All right. There's no one else at the mics. Approval of item 17 would require a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. That brings us to Article 17. Uh, for the selectmen, Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town rescind the balance of funds authorized but unexpended from prior community preservation projects, totaling $182,883.72 and transfer said funds into the Community Preservation Committee general fund balance or reserve fund balance from which they originally appropriated as the case may be in accordance with the Community Preservation Act as listed in the uh, advisory committee booklet. Beautifully done. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Harris. Discussion, Mr. Mark. Uh, folks, this is sort of like some of the things you heard earlier tonight. This article reconciles unexpected surplus balances in previously approved projects and acquisitions by the uh, Community Preservation Committee. It transfers the balance back into the, their general fund for future appropriations. So, for example, if an article was approved back in whenever, say, 2009, and it was estimated to be at a certain dollar value per acre, but then the binding appraisal came in at less dollars per acre, then there's money left over. And this takes that leftover money and puts it back into CPC uh, for use for future projects. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. For the advisory committee, Mr. Judge. Mr. Murray, can I show explain the purpose of this article? The advisory committee recommends unanimous approval of this motion. Further discussion? Gentleman to my left. Uh, Michael Hayes, uh, 35 Allen Place. Uh, through you, Mr. Moderator, I'd just like to ask you a question on this one as far as 125000 out of the affordable uh, housing trust and, and why that's being done. Uh, for the $125,000, the money was initially appropriated and then um, because there were several ongoing studies as to what to do with the balance that they already had, they decided not to add to the fund that's in, in currently in existence um, because of that existing money. So they decided not to add to it until additional progress was made. Thank you. I'd just like to encourage uh, town meeting and, and the, the Board of Selectmen going forward. It seems to me the uh, CPC uh, 
as far as the housing, uh, affordable housing trust and initiative has seemed to lose some steam, and I'd, I'd love to see uh, that uh, re-emphasized. Thank you. There being no one else with the mic, this approval of this motion will require a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared a majority. Article 18 on the motion of Mr. Harris. I move that the town amend the general bylaws of the town section 20110, the manner of calling the meeting, by striking the words 30 days in the first sentence and inserting the words at least seven days. Is there a second? Seconded to Chairman Vignani. Discussion, Mr. Harris. This article changes the current bylaw requirement that the warrant be published 30 days in advance of the annual town meeting to no less than seven. The 30-day requirement significantly impedes the ability of town officials to develop a timely budget as a warrant must be closed well in advance of town knowing local aid numbers, employees' benefit amounts, so on. The printer requires also a week's notice, uh, so budgets must be due from departments in November, only five-twelfths into the fiscal year. Well, somehow, change in the bylaw would, res would result in extra time to hone in on budget numbers with much more accuracy, reliability, provide the amount uh, the additional amount of time for officials to review these issues and items that may arise at the last minute. The bylaw review uh, voted unanimously to support this article. From the advisory committee, Mr. Antonelli. Uh, what this bylaw does is it just gives the uh, town officials more time to develop what they presented for you tonight. The advisory board unanimously approves this project. There being no one at the mic's approval of this amendment requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 19, flood claim maps adoption. On the motion, Mr. Harris. I move that the town amend the town of Central Wetlands regulations by incorporating any additional requirements of paragraph 60.3D and E of the National Flood Insurance Protection, the NFIP, regulations into the existing wetlands regulations and further to direct the Conservation Commission to adopt and incorporate said regulations into the town of Central Wetlands regulations prior to July 17, 2012 after a duly noticed public hearing. Second, Mr. Norton, discussion, Mr. Harris. Hmm? You don't want to discuss, okay? No. Well, you usually uh, tell us about it first. The town's flood maps are updated every five years, as you may know. Uh, when they're approved by FEMA, the town must incorporate them into the wetlands regulations of the Conservation Commission after accepting a town meeting. This is a housekeeping item that we'll see every five years. The town's participation in this program assists homeowners in receiving reduced rates on their flood insurance. The Bylaw Review Committee again voted to recommend this item. Thank you. From the Advisory Committee, Mr. Taylor. The advisory committee unanimously agrees with this motion. Discussion from the floor. There was no one at the mics. Approval of Article 19 requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 20, mooring regulations bylaw adoption. Uh, if you'll just indulge me for one minute, I just want to put into the record uh, that uh, Greggy Harris, Chairman of the Bylaw Review, Review Committee, in a memorandum dated March 16, two, uh, 2012, uh, states that the Bylaw Review Committee held a hearing on March 15th and recommended uh, adoptions of Articles 18, 19, and 20. And I'll give a copy of this to the time. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, everybody, for sticking around uh, this long. Uh, I've been waiting for this uh, article here all night myself. It's one of my favorites. 
Um, Mr. Moderator, I move that the town amend its waterways bylaws as follows. Section 30910, definitions, insert the definition, commercial fishermen. An individual holding a federal or state commercial ground fish, lobster, and or scallop license whose principal means of employment is fishing and the sale of catch. Section 30920, mooring permits, by adding the following language at the end of subsection B. Subject to the town's situate mooring rules and regulations and waterways bylaws, subsection mooring rules and regulations, H, a mooring owned by a commercial fisherman as defined in section 30910 definitions, with the approval of the harbor master, may be used to moor a commercial fishing vessel owned by another commercial fisherman for up to two years. Section 30920, replace the period at the end of the sentence with no person shall own more than one mooring with a comma and add the following language, except a commercial fisherman is defined in section 30910 definitions and an owner of a certified mooring service who may own up to two moorings for the purpose of mooring commercial fishing vessels owned by said commercial fishermen or commercial vessels used in the operation of certified mooring service. Furthermore, a commercial fisherman as defined in section 30910 definitions may also own one additional mooring for the purpose of mooring a recreational vessel owned by said commercial fishermen or take any other action relative thereto. Is there a second? Second to Mr. Harris. Discussion is like the Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, this results from many discussions with the Harbor Master, uh, the Waterways Commission, members of the Situate uh, Commercial Fleet, and other uh, concerned citizens. And I see the Chairman of the Waterways Commission, John Murphy, is still in the back there. And other members of Waterways are around, and I'd like to, to thank them for their work on this, as well as Mr. Patterson, the Harbor Master. Um, the basic point here is that commercial fishing is changing and our bylaws need to change to keep up with these changing times. The intent of these mooring bylaw revisions is to stimulate economic activity in the commercial fishing fleet and in those ancillary businesses that depend on the fishing industry, people selling ice, fuel, moving the fish around as well. The first change would allow mooring owned by a commercial fisherman to be used by another commercial fisherman for up to two years. Currently, one cannot utilize a mooring they do not own for longer than seven days. So for example, if, a, if, a, if a, um, one commercial be, uh, vessel is being hauled out and worked on and it's going to be out for a couple weeks, that mooring's lying empty and nobody else can use it. And we'd like to be able to have other commercial fishermen be able to use that as well. Because currently, if it is not being utilized, it's considered presumptive evidence that the mooring is being rented, which actually isn't allowed under the current law. So this change allows a fisherman who has a boat and state or federal permits to actually fish while they're on the mooring list, for example. The second change will allow a commercial fisherman to own up to two moorings for the purposes of mooring commercial fishing vessels. There's two reasons for this change. One is to allow fishermen to grow their business and take advantage of potential economies of scale. And with a lot of changes in the federal and the state uh, regulations, for example, um, uh, the commercial fisherman might want a couple different vessels to be uh, tailored for uh, fishing for different types of catch. Uh, so uh, currently because an individual cannot own, oh excuse me, this change also allows commercial fishermen to own one additional mooring for the purpose of mooring a recreational vessel. Currently because an individual cannot own multiple moorings, if you're a commercial fisherman then you're not allowed to have a recreational boat uh, hooked up to a mooring either just by virtue of their occupation and we didn't think this made much sense and was fair at all. The final change that we're asking you to vote to approve here is a tighter definition of commercial fishermen intended to prevent potential abuses of these proposed bylaw changes. Um, the bylaw review committee voted to recommend this article as the moderator just pointed out and again it results from lengthy discussion of commercial fishermen, concerned citizens, the harbor master, and the waterways commission uh, as well. And we urge you to the Board of Selectmen were unanimous in support of this, and we also urge your support as well. From the Advisory Committee, Ms. Cummings. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The Advisory Board unanimously supported this article and recommends town meeting approve this motion. Gentlemen at the center mic. Uh, hi, uh, Todd Breitenstein, 28 Marshall Lab. I was just wondering, uh, is the commercial fisherman's recreational Mooring going to be open to other commercial fishermen for commercial fishing purposes? 
I don't think so. I believe it's going to be a, tied to that person's name, just like any other recreational um, boat owner. You have to have the, the proof of title and all that sort of thing, but it's tied to the individual commercial fisherman. So that cannot go into the pool, if you will. Gentlemen, the center mic. Uh, Jamie Gilmore, again, 735 First Parish Road. I have just one issue of the legal lease language at the very last sentence, or take any other action relative there too, and I think that's what this gentleman was just speaking about as well. Just such an all-encompassing end remark. I would prefer it if it, it, it read, uh, take that off and it just read. It's the period at the end of commercial fishermen. I'll just uh, address that to Mr. Gilmore. Uh, that is just surplusage that probably shouldn't have been included in the motion. I'm sure if Mr. Murray uh, accepts it as a um, accidental inclusion and the seconder agrees, we can delete that. Thank you. I, I certainly approve of that suggestion, Mr. Murray. And the seconder, uh, well, I don't hear the second. Okay, he's good too. So I think we're all set. Thank you, Mr. Gilmore. There being no one else at the mic's approval of this article requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so vote and declare unanimous. Article 21, acceptance of public way, Ava's Lane, on the motion of Mr. Harris. I move that the town vote to accept Ava's Lane as laid out by the Board of Selectmen as a public way. So moved and seconded discussion, Mr. Harris. There's another uh, street acceptance right after this. It's basically the same. I'll just read the backup for this one because they are right next to each other, the same age, the same things apply. The town has uh, a street acceptance process that's been adopted by this board in 2010 and endorsed by the street acceptance committee. The legal process for acceptance of public ways is you know, formalized. Uh, there are a number of specific deadlines that must be met, time frames, the board to meet, including the layout of the way, the review by the planning board, notification to abutters prior to a public meeting by the board of selectmen. The street acceptance committee recommended two streets to be placed in this annual town meeting, uh, Avis Lane and Lauren Lane. The basis for the recommendation was that at least three quarters of the property owners on these roadways requested this. No betterments are required um, of either of these streets. The town encourages owners on private ways to work with the town to bring their roads up to standards so they can be accepted as public ways. This then permits the town to perform snow activities, repairs on the roads, and increases the number of streets in the town, which under the Chapter 90 helps this town. From the advisory committee, Mr. Sand. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, as uh, Mr. Harris had mentioned, there's um, no betterments uh, being uh, associated with this particular parcel. It's a relatively brand new uh, neighborhood and road. Um, both articles actually are part of the uh, same neighborhood. Um, the uh, advisory board recommended uh, approval of this motion. Um, it was unanimous in its vote. Discussion. There's no one at the mic. I do have a question for purposes of quantum of vote. Uh, is it Ava's Lane and Laura Lane are they on a subdivision plan? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Majority vote. Uh, there being no further discussion, all those in favor of acceptance of uh, Ava's Lane signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. So voted and declared unanimous. Article 22 on the motion, Mr. Harris. I move that the town vote to accept Warren Lane as laid out by the Board of Selectmen as a public way. So moved and seconded. Discussion, Mr. Harris. The backup is just the same as the previous article. Like Mark just said, uh, done by the same developer, same town, and uh, it's all it's up to code. From the Advisory Committee, Chairman Sandy. Uh, the Advisory Board uh, was unanimous in its vote, recommends approval of the motion. Uh, discussion. There being no one at the mics. This requires a majority vote for acceptance. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 23, resolution, nuclear safety. The motion, Mr. Harris. I move that the town adopt the following resolution. That the town of Citroën, Massachusetts, opposes the relicensing of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station 
until all safety improvements recommended by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as a result of the lessons learned from the failures of similarly designed reactors in Fukushima, Japan have been fully implemented and request that the NRC to immediately suspend all further action on the application of the Energy Corporation for renewal of its license to operate PNPC until full implementation has been accomplished. The clerk of situate shall forward the text of this article to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the town situate state and federal delegations, the select boards within the emergency planning zone of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station and Energy Corporation so that the intent of the citizens of situate is widely known. The resolution has been moved. Is it seconded? Numerous seconds. Discussion, Mr. Harris. If it's all right with you, Mr. Moderator, I was going to ask the proponent to speak. Why don't you introduce the proponent? And we'll turn it down. Ma'am, could you introduce yourself? Ma'am, could you introduce yourself to the meeting? Thank you. I'm Becky Chin, and I co-chaired the Duxbury Nuclear Advisory Committee. Okay, great. Uh, I will assume the consent of the meeting to allow the non-voter to address the meeting unless there is objection. You may proceed. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of allowing the non-voter to speak signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? Ma'am, you may speak. Article 23 is a town-wide resolution that will send the message that Situate does not exist in a vacuum when it comes to the nuclear reactor just down your coastline. The NRC's own task force has listed 12 immediate action items pursuant to the accident in Japan at the Fukushima nuclear reactor site where four reactors, the same class and design as Pilgrim, exploded last year. Only a few of these items have been ordered by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to the individual reactor owners and its sites in the United States. Two of the fixes include the direct torus vent and the spent fuel pool, but they don't go far enough to make these components safer. Last week, our Massachusetts Attorney General filed an appeal to the U.S. First Circuit Court of Appeals asking that the court force the NRC to reevaluate Pilgrim's environmental impacts and risks in light of last year's nuclear meltdown in Japan. Copley also wants the NRC to address the measures that would be used to reduce these risks before the new license is issued. In March, the town of Duxbury overwhelmingly voted to support a similar article as here tonight. Kingston is voting tonight. Provincetown voted last week. Marshfield will vote in two weeks. Plymouth will vote a freeze relicensing ballot initiative in May, as well as several other communities on the Cape. I urge you to vote in favor of this article with it. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before you this evening. Gentlemen of the center mic. Uh, Dennis Bedore, Meet Oceanside Drive, Situate. Uh, I've been around a lot of nuclear things. I've worked on nuclear submarines, done all that. But uh, I only have one question. Where are we going to get our power? We're building all these big, beautiful buildings. And we're going to expand the schools. Where are we going to get our power? If we pass this, it's going to go down. And believe me, I was a pole lineman. I worked out on those big power lines, the ones that you people don't see. And if you keep getting surges of power, they shut it down, you're going to burn those lines off. And you're going to be in serious trouble. We won't have no power. So you might as well get your candles ready and your flashlights and find your way home before dark, because you will have no power. And they're talking about the license. The license means you can't drive a car without a license. If you take the license from the people, they can't operate the power plant. Because if they do, fines come. And as far as terrorism goes, back in 1970, there's a special operations. People don't know what they do. I can speak of it now, because it's 30 years later. You can't get thrown in jail. We had things on the docket where you tried to break into power plants. Now you hear they arrest these guys. And you never hear from them again. 
Well, we were one of those. Never managed to get into one. They got you before you got in it. So that's just my opinion. But I'm getting my flashlight ready and my generator because you're going to need it. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, to my left. Janaid Yassin, 21 Beacon Road. Sir. Uh, I'm a nuclear engineer and a registered professional engineer. And I've been designing utility grade power plants, coal fired nuclear plants, for the better part of 30 years. I think I want the town of Citra, I, the town of Citra to know that the Pilgrim plant, the design that it is, the Mark I, which I used to design in the early 70s, not a single one of them has been sold since 1970. This design was superseded by the Mark IIs and finally the Mark III's. And it was recognized even in the early 1970s when I was working on them that the Mark I was fatally flawed. And so I think some of us who have been in the industry long enough have always wondered when the nuclear plant, which nuclear plant to have an accident. I'm a supporter of nuclear plants, I design them. But I know, like many of my compatriots and colleagues know, that the Mark I is really not the answer. And I think we're very lucky to have survived 40 years without an accident. So I think what, we're not, what some of us proponents are saying is, let's, we're not against nuclear power, we want nuclear power. But let's know that there is a defective design that most of the industry understands. Let us have an open hearing. Let us learn the lessons of Fukushima, and if we can make the Pilgrim plant safer, so be it. But we all should recognize that if there's a Fukushima-type accident, then we in Sichuan and those in downtown Boston will be affected by the radiation plume that is affected. And we could shut down all the Mark I reactors in this country, and we wouldn't even know the difference in our power capacity. But 18% of the power in this country comes from nuclear power. The Mark I reactors are a very small percentage of that. We would not even feel the difference Pilgrim shuts down every year for refueling. We never know the difference. We are running surplus in gas and in coal. So I urge the fellow citizens of uh, Situate to please vote for this resolution and support Martha Coakley or AG to say, look, let's have an open hearing and let's do the right thing. Thank you. Please vote for the resolution. Gentlemen at the Mr. center, Mike. George Kelly, 450 Country Way. May I ask you, Mr. Moderator, if the woman that just spoke, has she ever been inside the building? Is that okay to ask her? Of course, ma'am. Fifteen years ago, I chaired the school committee for the town of Duxbury, and I had a private tour through the building. Okay. I have also. I went with the senior citizens of Situate and we toured the entire building. I have been in the postal department for over 25 years and then in real estate for 60 years. I have never ever seen any place as clean as the Plymouth Nuclear Power Plant. It is unbelievable how neat it is. You couldn't ask for better care. And I feel that this is not in our jurisdiction even to tell them what and tell the government what should happen. I think we have enough experts working on these things and we are in need of power. Uh, we've just installed a windmill. Uh, we're supposedly going to install some more things on the uh, former dump area. Thank you. It, it's just uh, unbelievable. We think that we know a lot more than the authorities that have been doing these things for 50 to 60 years. Thank you. Uh, we have another non-voter who wishes to address the meeting, uh, Mr. Bosom of Plymouth. I will assume the consent of the meeting to allow him to speak unless I hear an objection. 
hear an objection. All those in favor of allowing the non-voter to speak signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? Aye. You may speak. It was close. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, uh, town meeting members. I came as a resident of Plymouth tonight to speak to you on this issue. Uh, I feel I've established residency tonight, though. I've uh, been here that long. But in any case, my name is Theodore Boson from Plymouth. Uh, I am uh, Secretary of the Freeze Plymouth Committee in Plymouth. We've established the same or very similar language in our ballot question. And I've assisted, uh, I appeared before your selectmen. They voted four to one to put this before you. Uh, briefly, I just wanted to clarify a misunderstanding that uh, seems to have been created. This is not a shutdown referendum. In fact, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission can and will keep the plant operating on its current license as long as uh, relicensing is in deliberation. That's indefinitely. And that was stated in the last uh, dissenting opinion by Judge Young of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board, who in fact agrees with this position. So you're in good company if you vote for it. The chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission also agrees with this position because he voted for it in the dissenting opinion three weeks ago. So uh, our Attorney General, the chairman of the two licensing boards that have uh, addressed this question um, in, in basically assenting, uh, dissenting opinions, uh, agree that the Fukushima lessons need to be addressed in advance of relicensing. It's not about a shutdown. In fact, if these are addressed up front, they mean more jobs, they mean more revenue for the town of Plymouth, actually. Uh, they actually mean safety for us. We have pro-nuclear people on our committee who are very much in favor of nuclear power, who want to see these Fukushima lessons addressed up front, not on the back burner. And just to give you an example, you people are within 25 miles of this power plant, but you have no evacuation planning whatsoever. Now, one of the Fukushima recommendations from the lessons learned at Fukushima was indeed to expand the evacuation planning zone. The zone in Fukushima, even though most of the radiation blew out to sea, the zone upon which fallout fell, in actuality, was 25 miles. You are well within that 25 miles. You have no monitors. You have no emergency sirens. You have no stockpiles of potassium iodide to prevent uh, thyroid cancer. Uh, you have uh, no meteoro meteoro I can't even say it, you know, weather devices and you have basically no evacuation planning, okay? Now this is one of the recommendations they're gonna look 30 into. 30 seconds. It. But when are they looking into it? They've decided not to do it within the first five years, not to do it within the second five years, but they have it as a third tier. So you are last on the list. So all I'm saying to you is stand up for yourself. And simply, it's a non-binding referendum, express yourself that you ought to be first on their list and not last when it comes to safety. Thanks very much. Oh, no, please, please. No, no, everybody's had one whack at it. Uh, well, you're everybody, uh, and you're the only one looking for the second one. Lady at the right. Nancy Toppin, 26 Clap Road. Move the question. Is there a second? All those in favor of moving the question signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? So voted to declare two thirds vote. We now advance to the question. All those in favor of the resolution as presented signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed? Uh, the resolution passes. Uh, the last item is a motion to adjourn. Before I accept that, I want to thank you all very much for hanging in there and having a good sense of humor about everything. It's been moved to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Good job. Good. Stand in adjournment.